We're live. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Kind of Funnies. Kevin Smith's View a Universe in review. That's right. We are ranking and reviewing every single movie in the View a Universe. It's going to be a good time. Uh, this is our show, Kind of Funny, in review, where we review movies, franchises, week to week. This this run, we are doing Transformers and the Kevin Smith movies, Transformers movies on Fridays, Kevin Smith movies on Tuesdays. Next up, we're going to be doing Lord of the Rings. That's all very exciting stuff. You can watch the show live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. You can watch it later on youtube.com slash kindoffunny or roosterteeth.com. You can also get it as a podcast. Just search your favorite podcast service for Kind of Funny Reviews. Um, you can get the show ad-free by going to patreon.com slash kindoffunny, just like our Patreon producers did. Mohammed Mohammed, Cameron Reagan, Steve Powers, Lee Palero, Julian the Gluten Free Gamer, Kieran O'Donnell, Drew Garnier, and Al Treisman. Thank you all very much. What Today if we got? What if we me. threw some gluten at Julian the Gluten Free Gamer? Nice. Nice oh, right good. there. Shrivels wow. up, up like a slug. You know I mean? like a celiac. <laughs> Andy, if you had to throw gluten at him, what, what would you throw at him? I don't know, man. What? Great I don't question. even know what. I don't even know. I, like, yeah. I'd have to ask the science with Kev question. Poppy seed bagel. Yep, there you go. That'll work. I'd, I'd roll a fucking chocolate chip cookie right out of his dome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tim Gettys. We got the big dog, Kevin Coelho, in the, the oh, Kevin oh. Smith hat. I'm liking it. It's Blunt Man hat. It's good. It's real good. We got Greg Miller. Hey, it's me. How are you? Good to see you. I like, I like your Heavy. headphones. Thank you. I got, and I also want you all to know I have a bit, I have a fit of the giggles. <laughs> <laughs> good show. We're gonna have fun here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we got Andy Cortez. Hey, good morning, like, everybody. Box. Mm-hmm. Oh, is it on camera? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, this oh, is you, can, you guys can't. No, the I, show can't see it. Oh. The show can't see it. Well, there it is. Kashi Golin cinnamon harvest. Yeah, it's really good. Really good stuff. Made some pumpkin bread this weekend. I put some cinnamon in there, Andy. And let me tell you, it was good. You know I love adding I mean? cinnamon to anything, Greg. Cinnamon is an underrated vegetable. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> and it's absolutely right. We also have Nick Scarfino. <laughs> I love it. Nick, I just like I just like the things you do. You know, if I could, I would be you. No, oh, okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that that's how's everyone doing? Is that just a weird thing? <laughs> Well, I complimented everyone and because they had nice fun things. Nick didn't have anything fun. He has oh, Coke Zero, I guess, but that's not. No, it's not fun. That's, Let's not lie to him nothing. just to make him feel better about his life choices. Today, we're talking about Chasing Amy, released on <laughs> April 4th, 1997, once again, directed by Kevin Smith. Mm. A budget mm. of $250,000. It's not much, Tim. That ain't much at all. You that might be How much, much was Mallrats again? One of the like lowest. 19 million. Yeah, this might be one of the lowest budget movies we've ever ever done a little fun fact here is when kevin smith pitched the idea to miramax he also said that he had written in the parts with his friends ben affleck jason lee and joey lauren adams in mind miramax however wanted to cast people who had already celebrity status like john stewart david schwimmer and drew barrymore um these three were actually suggested the film's original budget of three million dollars depended on miramax's support ultimately smith suggested that he make the movie with his three original actors on his own and miramax could buy it if they liked it miramax owners bob weinstein and harvey weinstein liked the idea and gave him 250k to make the movie 1 24th of the budget of his previous film mall rats Good lord. That's what I happens think, when you have the governor's ball and all this other shit in Mall Rats. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck, he cannot work I watched, I, I watched Mall Rats, the unextended edition this morning. Yeah. 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 And, What'd you think? I mean, it's it's a movie. I hate you. It is I a hate movie. You so much. <laughs> it's you much know, better than you the extended You watched it this morning. Cut. It is much better than the extended cut. Thank you. The thing that's about all that's all we wanted on the record. But it's still a lot of watching. Better. It's still what? Under Clerks. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about that is, I, I think Kevin Smith. I think that's that's spot on, right? Like, I, there are certain filmmakers that need the constraints of a budget to get creative and just really kind of. For for Kevin, I feel like that focuses his message more with every film. Like the more, well, with the exception of Yoga Hosers, but I don't know if that's in the View Skewerverse. Hopefully not. It is. No. No. Thank God. Um, but like, this is a perfect example to me of like him going back to his roots and just focusing on what he's best at, which is have something to say and having a commentary on a social issue that, you know, when I was a kid, I watched this and it, it opened my eyes to a lot of the things that he was talking about. And rightfully so. Um, not the least of which was just, you know, the, the, the main concept of like someone's past is their past. And like, you should be judging them for that just because you're insecure. Um, that was some shit for me that was very formative. When I watched this, I was like, oh, that's a really that's a poignant message that you should be sending to, to younger guys so that they don't get caught up in the same bullshit that Holden's getting caught up in. Uh, and I think that the 250,000, I, I, it really just is, hey, 
at what point, what can we get for 250,000? Well, you can get some dialogue and a two shot. Well, great. That's perfect. Cause that's all we need for this movie. <laughs> we don't need there to be uh Jay and silent Bob flying through the sky with Batman uh, gear, even though I love that part. This is more of just like, let's tell a, a poignant story. It was good. Um, I liked it a lot. Box really, really 12 it. million runtime of an hour 53. Andy continue. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I think it got back to what I enjoyed so much about clerks was well-written dialogue um and and this time with really with better actors you know it, it just reminded me of clerks with better actors you know mm. um i i think the story was really nice and i think i'm glad that all the homophobia was contextualized like that like all, all of the all of the the slurs that are being thrown around at the beginning you're like Ugh, this is kind of rough but that it kind of plays part into the story it does play a part into the story where yeah. uh, jason lee's character is sort of dealing with these sort of inner struggles. Uh, yeah, I think it's great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed it too. I think that this is like by far my favorite so far. I think that this Same. really works as a movie and like it had all the things I enjoyed most about Clerks and the bits I liked about Mallrats, but it was actually wrapped in, in like an actual film, like an actual movie with more of a traditional kind of beginning, middle and end. And, you know, there wasn't too many tangents. The Jay and Silent Bob stuff definitely felt out of nowhere, but... I enjoyed it. I feel like yeah, as I like, I like going it. on, you know, I, like, and I, I think they do such a great job. And I remember watching the first time too of like when they pop up, being surprised that they pop up. Yeah, you know, like because it seemed like oh, they're just going to reference them as these comic book characters, and then to have them pop up, say their piece, and leave, and not be shoehorned into the story other places. Like it was this, it, I, even the way they frame it and re- reveal them of like who's shit in the serial kind of thing, and they pan up, you're like whoa, fuck, right? And then it's like as soon as it you realize what's happening, and you're regulated to it. It's over. And it started to feel like a universe with all the the characters being referenced and like just mm-hmm. the names that you you start hearing over and over. And that doesn't necessarily like connections don't make a thing good, but I think that they make a good thing better. And I think that this is the first time that we're kind of seeing that like play out in a way that doesn't feel gimmicky. And yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed this one a lot more. I I really enjoyed it as well. Um, there were some things that I noticed this time that I hadn't. Uh, noticed beforehand where like um, in, in the start there's this, there's a moment where they're talking about their, not the start like the first like third they're talking about like the scars they've gotten through sex and stuff and one of the things that um, was it not Brody Bank, Banky's talking Banky, about Banky Edwards yeah is that uh, he he got a scar from Brandy Brandy Svenning Svenning and then they her show father her father and it's like yeah. why didn't they just get micro my uh michael Rooker? michael Rooker cost money yeah <laughs> i mean that's true yeah, yeah, yeah. To put in there and like make him look it's exactly the same someone totally different and like yeah. there's a couple of those choices there that they made where it's like i wish that they had made some characters that are the same actors in uh, like why wasn't brody just banky like why weren't like i would i feel like it would have been stronger if they were the same character but like that's me like nitpicking like i actually really enjoy this movie i think that it's it's interesting and it's one of those things like at the end i'm like oh man you could tell that um uh what kevin smith's favorite movie uh in the star wars trilogy is um the second one was empire empire Empire. 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 because it's like it, it ends on such a like oh these people make bad decisions and it's not a fairy tale ending you know and i i like that in this Well, it's supposed yeah, to be I mean, real, the, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a message. I mean, this is definitely like a him him writing for his contemporaries, capturing that feeling of like the first love when you're younger, before you've really lived your life, and not necessarily like just because you're 25, 26 doesn't mean that you are ready to take on that that adult relationship. And I think that a lot of us have had that relationship where it was the one where you're like, I'm so caught up in this, and it's torrid and it's crazy, and you learn so much about yourself, but it also it always sort of like it just ends horribly. But in that, there is a lesson to be learned where you either shudder it or there's personal growth. And I feel at the end of this, um, Holden has that a great moment where he realizes like, you know, I, it's all about like this, all of this shit was my shit, but that I brought into this, right. Holding someone accountable for their actions. Like I, I forget what the quote at the end says where it, in, in the book chasing Amy, but it's something to the, to the degree of like, you have to judge the individual by where they're at right now, not by their past or like what they've done or whatever. I'm like, I think that's, that's very poignant. And I think that's very, that's very personal for him. Um, I, I would love to sit down with him. Like where, where did this come from? Because this is one of those like clerks really is about that movie of being like, 
just kind of lost and not and aimless and not really having a good direction to be in where and this one really is about like discovering yourself and, and being in a relationship and who you are in a relationship and all that stuff and like it's just fa it's fascinating it feels he, he so saying, personal he was saying that it, it came from his relationship um with Alyssa in real life uh, joey lauren adams yeah um Interesting. and he was saying that like what it was based on was fights that they would get in uh and then she was actually the one saying this in the interview that i was reading that um it was based on their relationship and their stupid fights they were getting because he was insecure that she was he was like this New Jersey boy, but she was like a lot more world traveled and like mm. had experiences that he didn't have and like at that point couldn't have. So he was super insecure about it and it led to a lot of issues in their relationship, which I mean she's been to the biodome. There what you go. Yeah. I mean there is that there's there is the moment I mean there's two uh moments that they sort of uh highlight where Ben Affleck is like, Yeah, I had a more personal story to tell this time. And then early on, he's like, well, we'll tell that story when I have more personal things to talk about. And I, it, it just really does feel like Kevin Smith was, you know, totally. you know pour, pouring his heart out in this one, you know. Mallrats yeah. was his blunt man in Chronic, right? Where he's just doing dick and fart jokes, but he wants to say something personal. And when yeah. are you gonna say, well, what are you going to say that when I have something personal to say? Yeah. So, yeah, this is the reaction to that, right? And I think, you know, for me, obviously, yeah, I enjoy the movie. I, I've always enjoyed the movie. But it's one of those that I feel... It, it, again, as I've said with the last two, and then I'll say with this one again, time capsules, right, of what it was in 1997, let alone what I think the concept of sexuality was in 1997. Not that everything's fixed and hunky-dory now, but I mean, the some of the conversations, right, you look at, and I'm watching, and I was watching with Jen and Lucy for the first, who they've never seen it before. And so these things are happening, I'd be like, well, for for context, like, it was just a big deal that there were gay people on screen let's get let's 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 pave that first and then this is going somewhere and then yeah this and then like the whole scene at the end like you know when holden's laying it out both of them like no 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 and so when uh Alyssa finally stands up and fucking smacks holden right and i won't be your whore and walks out they were super into it and they were like yeah fuck holden i'm like again yes fuck holden he's no he's he's making a lot of bad choices here but again like it's this weird time capsule of being young and stupid and being hung up on that bullshit right and like I feel like it's that weird thing. The further, the older I get going back and watching, this is like the first one that I've, where you go back and watch it. It's like, I totally get what it is, but I just don't connect with these characters in, this, in the same way at all. Like, I think one of my favorite ones is uh, when uh, Holden is, gives Alyssa the, you know, the Jersey pop quiz, right? You know, quick stop and all this stuff. And we'll get to it in the recap. But then he's like, man, what a small fucking world. And it's like, Dude, you're in fucking Manhattan talking to somebody from New Jersey. You're not in like Saigon and you just right. walked into a he bar and ran into Leonardo <laughs> who went to Hudson or whatever. It's like, no, yeah, like, but it's like that is the thing of like if I had gone downtown Chicago, like, you know, like Poe did after uh, college or whatever and met somebody from like the town next to us, you would have been like, oh, man, a small world. Like, what the fuck <laughs> you talking about? Not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, f I feel like um... – you know, I, f I think going back and watching it as, as, a, as an adult in their in your late 30s or early 40s, yeah, you're not going to connect with it. But putting it back into context of like when I watched this, where this oh, movie yeah. came out in 96, right? Seven, seven. 97. So I was 17 years old watching this. And so I was going through a lot of like the experiences that Holden was going through as far as far as like having those first relationships and understanding that sexuality wasn't necessarily a black and white issue. Right. Um, and, and this movie was very, very important for me to watch because it's in many ways, a very uncomfortable movie, right? right? It's in many ways. It's like my wife was watching it and she had to get up and leave because she was like, this is so, I want to like scream at this guy sometimes, or I want to yeah. scream at this other person sometimes or this. And I'm like, but that is the point of the movie, right? Mm -hmm. If you only ever made movies where the characters were perfect beings and they acted exactly like you wanted them to act, you wouldn't have a movie. You wouldn't have an arc. You wouldn't okay. have something where you see a character fuck up over and over again. And then you learn something from that character at the end. And thus you can apply that, that theme and that learn that the thing you've learned to yourself. Yeah. And so for me specifically, this was one of the movies where, you know, th throwing around the word faggot all the time, like resonated to me where I was like, I, I oh that's weird. That, that that's a that's a first time of seeing someone do that on screen and going that is actually uncomfortable to watch someone do sure. that. And then having sure. a gay character go, you know that that where what, the reason you're saying that word uh, and what you think why you think you're saying that word and why you're really saying that word might not be exactly the same, right? Mostly it's, it's like you think it's funny and it's fine, but realistically it's hurtful and it's coming from a place of insecurity yeah. and you need to find a better way to express yourself. You're and for me as a kid, correct. yeah, watching that, it, I was like, wow, that's – I should do that because – No, 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 yeah. You're right on the money on all that, Nick, because, yeah, I'm, I remember I would be watching this at, what, 14, 15, right? And it was the exact same situation you're talking about of – like I think there's – 
it's framed in an interesting way that makes it hard to swallow in the same way I think it's so hard when you're wrong and you get confronted in a way you don't want to be confronted of when uh, Holden sits back down on the couch next to Banky, right? And he's playing hockey and he starts uh, dropping Fs and this, that, and the other. And Holden does the whole thing of like this passive gay bashing. I know you're not a bad person at heart, yada, 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 right? And Banky like flips on him and grabs a piece of paper and all that crap. But like it is that thing of seeing that confronted on screen by as when we were, you know, kids watching this adults, right? Who were wrestling with this concept and what that actually meant. And again, to see, you know, I think, it's again, I think it's so hard to contextualize right now a 1997 movie in 2020 timeline, right? But like when uh, Alyssa and her whatever friend or Kim are making out at the restaurant, right? Or the bar, and uh, Banky's just staring and Holden hits him and he's like, What? When are we going to get to see something like this? I've never seen it close up. When are we going to see something like this without paying for it? It's like, again, that's how closeted it was in many, in many ways where it wasn't represented somewhere that you and i'm not saying like to stare at lesbians at the time but i'm saying like sure. it was that thing of like two women kissing Whoa! the, the but, thing but that the impressed same. me the most about this is like i've never seen the movie before so being 30 in 2020 now watching it for the first time i yeah. feel like i totally am in line with what you guys are saying just without that nostalgic mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. sense tied to it Lens, because yeah. i think that the, this movie is is very 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 problematic only on the surface it's very progressive at its core and that 100%. shines through the entire time like i i think that the message of this movie and the takeaways and what you learn as a viewer from it is so much better than that the characters themselves like i actually think that most of the characters um with the exception of her like kind of suck even just as characters not just like oh they're bad people whatever it's like i don't really enjoy their arcs but i feel like it makes my arc make sense like watching it based on how i feel about their actions and stuff like um ben affleck in this it's just like he is such a weird unbelievable character to me in the way he does it, so many of the actions that he takes in this movie but i can look at that and be like i would never do that but also it's making me feel uncomfortable and i do get what kevin smith is saying with this movie and i think that's the most important thing and like that's why this is actually like a good movie well like for like and but that's the point right is you're not necessarily supposed to love ben affleck's character in fact i think for the most part you're supposed to not you're you're supposed to not like him very much um which is a difficult thing to do to your protagonist but i mean that 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 is the whole that, that's why i think this movie is still relevant today right is like you see like how many times have you popped on twitter and seen conversations that are that have that mirror not necessarily in in form but in sort of like in or function well not necessarily like the exact way but uh, conversations on twitter like this where you see people arguing back and forth um and and you're you're looking at one person going you i know you're wrong about this but like you, until it until it occurs to you until something big like this happens in your life you're always going to be dug in and stuck in on this issue um you see it in comments you see it all the time so like i i, I watch this and like greg i know you say like this is it's, it's so kind of anachronistic to watch it in, uh, in in 2010 but i think it's even more relevant today than it was back then maybe not for for uh um, reasons yeah, the same reasons, but I mean, the the same the same conversations we're having we were having in the '90s about uh, people being gay, we're now having about people being transsexual, right? We're, we're having about the acceptance right. of people um, in in other areas that maybe didn't get a lot a lot of light shined on them because we were focusing on the, those issues in the '90s. And so I, I think, think I watch this. So go ahead. I think it's interesting too. Where, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not knocking. I love chasing Amy. I love Kevin Smith's universe. I love all this stuff. I think what's interesting as I'm watching it now, being like, oh yeah, you, but like it's like whatever, two women kissing, whatever, you know, having multiple partners, threesomes, whatever. The the, the past of your, why would that matter, right? I think it's so interesting and snake eating its tail, full circle of like the seed of me not giving a shit about any of that stuff now right is because i watched this movie at 14 <laughs> and like saw this laid out and saw how it played out mm-hmm. for holden right and saw how ha- holding on to that kind of shit would like lead to ruining a great thing when you you know you can't get out of the way of yourself kind of thing and i think on top of that you know we're talking a lot about like obviously the movement and again time capsule way i think the movements of uh you know for uh you know, the what am I? I don't know. We're talking about you know how it, it's changed to be gay on film, how it's changed to be gay in real life. Uh, we talk about Holden being young and stupid, right? I think there's also the I think again very time capsule way that it can be throughout your life though of having these kind of friendships, right? The banking and Holden friendship that is toxic in a lot of ways. They love each other in you know in varying degrees, but it's toxic and they don't know how that actually operates right and so when it's good and they're on the same path it's great when they're suddenly you know 
split off in different directions becomes incredibly destructive and so quickly and i know that even like watching that uh with jen and stuff like she she said something about one of them when banky was uh, given holding shit about even wanting to hang out with Alyssa early on or something i forget what the exact point in the movie was but basically the you know the whole relationship of the movie like why would you listen to him and it's like well i definitely have friends that i've been in that situation with where you're you're thick as the bestest friends everything we're on the same lane everything is great and then something goes wrong and suddenly it's like well fuck now we're not at all and like are we right. fighting about this like why are we fighting yeah. why do you care what i fucking do yeah it's 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 that insecurity of like well if you used to be alone like me and now you're not alone anymore and i still sure. want you there to be there for me but you're gonna go on dates and i'm and now okay. i'm sort of being left out or whatever mm -hmm. also shout out for having a Shout out to having a uh, Hoop, which is a character I, I really enjoyed. I, th I thought Hooper was awesome. He, yeah. uh, uh, I, there, there's great, a, a couple of great lines that he has where he's like, yeah, imagine being gay, but then imagine being a gay black man. Like, I'm the minority of the minority of the minority. I'm the minority like, of the minority of the minority. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's really, really really for me. <laughs> yeah, I think his character is super fascinating, not the least of which is because he's actually, like, even though he ends up being sort of the moral compass for Holden in a lot of ways, he also, in a, in a, because of the situation, has to lie about who he is as well. Yeah. So he's playing this other character that's straight. Because he because he because he doesn't think society is going to accept him as this like author as this artist if he if he is actually gay. Yeah. So there's that there's always that scene when I watched when I was a little when I was a child where he sees a little kid in in the record store and he goes see that man right there he's he's like the enemy never trust him and I, was, like, I always thought devil. that was funny never yeah, he's the devil I'm the devil <laughs> but then I watched it again I was like oh that's actually kind of sad that he totally like has he to has that. to he feels that he has to do that and perpetuate yeah. it. And it's and it's yeah. There's a lot of complexity to all these characters. I, yeah. I did want to shout out real quick that I, I don't know if he did this or not, but the fact that the main character's name is Holden, I don't know it if it was he, on purpose. Was it on purpose? Right. I, after there's other the field. The yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Uh, so wait, like, what's the, the other the other character? Um, I can't hear what you all are saying. What, what, what? Banky Banky is the uh, the gym teacher um, that lets his lets the kids uh, use his car to make out and fucking. Oh, in Catcher in the Rye. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, it's a booking that you wouldn't know, right? Doctor disrespected. I I thought you were still reading. talking about Ninja didn't like recommend all rats or some shit. I, no, no, I no, couldn't hear what right. anybody was saying. Um, I do like that. You know, when uh, when we do get the Jane Silent Bob um, cameo, it, they are you know they have the reference to do or do not. There is no tribe, but they totally are like Yoda. Like when they pop up, I you know they are that there was a point where I thought, are they just like figments of his imagination right now? Like, are they just <laughs> kind of these spirits kind of guiding him along this way? I thought that was really cool. That scene to me is, is my favorite scene in the movie. And like so far, my favorite scene in the the, the whole universe, because mm -hmm. that the idiot gear speech, the chasing Amy speech itself is yeah. so, so powerful that it's perfect dialogue. It's just so great of encapsulating what this, the theme is of this movie and the, what the lesson is, but it's not just what the lesson is. It's what you should learn from it. And like, I feel that the, uh, the way that they introduced it with chasing Amy and like her name, not being Amy, it was just such an interesting, like watching this movie, not knowing shit. I didn't know she was lesbian. So that was a reveal. I didn't like understand why they kept calling her Alyssa. If she wasn't fucking Amy. And then like when they did that, I was like, Oh my God, the idea of, this, you know, your insecurities and chasing these women, all this stuff, just chasing Amy as a, a name to define that mm -hmm. is great. Silent Bob could have stopped with just chasing Amy, and I felt that would have been powerful. But then he goes on with the whole idiot gear kicking in and all that stuff. And I'm like, this is just beautiful writing. Yeah, I love it. Well done. I, I Very did, well done. I didn't like how that started, though. The him like muttering chasing Amy as he's like biting his finger. Oh, I love it. I just felt like that came I out of so it. like no. Oh, people... dude! Every time I watch that scene, I love watching Kevin Smith. Or I love I love watching Kevin Silent Bob Amy. as he does yeah. the thing where he does it and he starts to and he stops and he goes. You're chasing. Like you can see the character's internal working of should I say something here? Yeah, yeah. why not? You're chasing Amy. <laughs> it's a, I, I, there's a little point in this too where like uh, where Jay kind of like. Like, uh, like flinches at him or not flinches at him, but like comes at him do and he something. goes, "Do something!" Yeah, you know. <laughs> and I just that's so funny. Let's get like the, you, you, you have this idea that Silent Bob is this goof, and then, and then he comes out and, and he's like the wise old sage yeah. every time, and it always gets me. I, I think I love it. I think it's set up fine. I think the fact that they have to get paid off for their likenesses and they don't give a shit yeah. about it, and like, I, like even to the point where Jay doesn't want. He's like, "I don't want this shit. These characters aren't us. We don't just fucking like hang out all day." And, what <laughs> is it? A, a really fun. Who the fuck talks like that? That's fucking. <laughs> 
nudes. Nudes. <laughs> I have a fun thing here, a fact about that scene. Uh, there's a scene uh, cut from Clerks where J- Jason Mewes explained, remember Kevin Smith bought a box of sugar? Well, he bought a box of sugar, then I was going to be eating the sugar in Clerks outside, but they cut that out. So all we saw was um, him buying the sugar, but Jay didn't actually eat the sugar. And he's just like, I'm just sitting here doing nothing in uh, chasing Amy. What should I do? And then uh, Kevin Smith was like, I don't know. And, and then I was like, how about the sugar? And he was like, oh, yeah, do the sugar. It'll make up for when we didn't do the sugar. So then I did it. And I just started eating the sugar. But that took like 11 or 12 takes. So, yeah, I ate lots of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> that, that reminds me of when I used it. to go to Coco's when I was a little fat kid. And I'd eat all of the jelly packets that, they, that were yeah. on the table. Yeah, of course. Of all course. of them. God, I can imagine all you doing that. that. All of them. Just with a spoon. And then I'd put my finger in like it was cocaine and I'd get the rest of it out in little cracks. And... Before we get to the, the plot, a couple more facts here. The studio initially suggested to Smith that he make Chasing Amy as a PG-13 high school movie. Smith thought about it for a time and wrote some scenes. Uh, Ethan Suppley was going to play one of the main characters, but then Smith changed his mind. A week later, I was like, no. Then the movie Mallrats tanked, and that sealed the deal. It was just like, that's the last movie I make that doesn't have anything on its mind. And I think you can really see that. Definitely. One. And, Another, uh, except oh, it's sorry. not the last one he ever made. But <laughs> <laughs> and according to Jason Lee, I work at. according to Jason Lee, there were four five day weeks of rehearsal followed by four five day weeks of shooting. So the entire movie was just shot in twenty days. Um, and it's one, of the, but it was one of the smoothest productions he'd ever been a part of. That's pretty cool. I will say the only thing they did that I think is just an egregious sin is allowing Ben Affleck to keep that goatee. Now, I know <laughs> that it's a sign of the 90s, but man, it makes him look so much the, – the the goatee and the bouffant hair that he has, like the yeah. – it's just so creepy. He comes off so creepy sometimes. Yeah. Let's I get to it. Oh. oh, go for it, Greg. I just did a trivia. I, we could do it when we get there too. I always found it interesting that uh, the scene where they compare their sexual injuries that Kevin was talking about earlier was originally going to – was written for mall rats. But they ended up cutting it in because they thought it was too raunchy, and so because it was going to be T.S. and Brody and uh, two other people, I forget who. So it was, was going to was gonna be in that movie because it was a Jaws reference, and it was going to tie into them going to the Jaws thing. Yeah, no, just Jaws yeah, even movie. even this, I don't, I'm not J- Jaws versed enough, but I've heard, read or heard from Kevin a million times that like. I guess the setup of the windows in the bar around the table is it mirrors the conversation piece in Jaws where they were around a table with the portholes or whatever. Oh, but, yeah. That's one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Shark's eyes. Shark's eyes. We're chasing Amy. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's get into it. Uh, so opening credits start. And uh, what you're getting here is uh, jump, dropped into the world of uh, Holden McNeil and Banky Edwards in their comic book, Blunt Man and Chronic. We see a bunch of news reports. Uh, or, well, not news reports, but news, newspapers, magazines about them. We see covers from it. We see a Wizard magazine cover, of course, of Blunt Man and Chronic busting out. We see uh, the comic buyer's guide, like a lot of throwbacks to fucking old comic book shop shit. I remember bringing home all the time. Uh, one of them being uh, talking about how well Blunt Man and Chronic's doing. Uh, also, if there's art for uh, the guidance counselor, Walt Flanagan comic with him with all the eggs where he's testing the eggs and clerks. That's mm-hmm. one of the banner ads. And they have uh, Alyssa's oh, comic funny. that we'll learn about later, uh, Idiosyncrasies or whatever it's called. Um, Idiosyncrasies routine. Uh, Idiosyncratic so that, tendencies. Right? Is there tendencies in? I thought it was routine. Idiosyncratic. I just remember it being the most pretentious '90s thing ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the word yeah. idiosyncratic is just so pretentious '90s. Yeah. I can't even say it. So yeah, syncratic routine. The second word I just can't I think, think it was. Of. Yeah, uh, <laughs> idiosyncratic routine. That's all it was. Oh, I was right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, back to the thing. <laughs> So, yeah, it's all going and it's doing the thing. And again, you're getting the whole, hey, Holden McNeil, they're these guys from New Jersey. They're busting out in the comics world. They have this super successful book, Blunt Man and Chronic. Um, also, if you're an eagle eye, when you watch it again, you'll notice all this, the, sh- the photos they're using in those are from scenes later in the movie, which break your brain when you watch it. You're like, <laughs> God damn it. Why would they take this shot? Why would Holden McNeil be in his boxer shorts on a fucking doorstep for this photo? It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> We then jump to the Manhattan Comic Con. It's run by Walt Flanagan, of course. A uh, whole bunch of people are there, and Holden and Banky are signing their book, Black Man and Chronic. Um, Ethan, right? Supp- Suppley, that's what we said his name was, right? Mm-hmm. He's, mm-hmm. One, he's talking to Holden, uh, talking about how great Black Man and Chronic is and how he wishes that he was like them and he was fighting things and sucking tits and doing all this horrible, gross shit or whatever. Uh, and I, I forget who he says. They're Cheech and Chong mashed up with uh, Bill and Ted. And, and uh, Holden's like, I always thought them more of a uh, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstand or 
Gil, whatever. Gil, he's Gil the other guy. So I don't even, I still don't even know the second set of who he's referencing. And in the sub, he's like, yeah, what? Meanwhile, on the other side of the table, which of course the table is no bigger than this. We've been designing tables, but their universe is apart in this world. Uh, Banky is also signing. Uh, Scott Mosier is here. Of course, Scott, Scott Mosier, uh, Kevin Smith's right hand and a million. He's Snowball in the other movie. He was the guy who played hockey in Clerks. He's uh, Roddy, Roddy Roddy and Mallrats. He's there. Uh, for some, he's in line to get the comic book signed, having no idea who these people are apparently. But then asking Banky who he is. So you draw this. No, I, you know, I'm I'm the inker. I go through. I had uh, depth and shading to the photo. You trace. No, I don't. You're a fucking tracer. You know, be fine with your station in life as a tracer. He's a phony. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Eventually, uh, as this continues to escalate or whatever, uh, uh, Rowdy Rowdy, uh, you know, uh, Scott Mosher turns around and grabs Casey Affleck, uh, Ben mm-hmm. Affleck's brother, who's like. Like five, eighteen in this, he's like, "Yo, <laughs> if I drew something, you drew something exactly the same, right on top of it. What would you call that? I don't know, tracing. See, you're a tracing." <laughs> uh, and, then it, and then he's like, "Let me sign the book." And he's like, "No, nah, I want the guy who draws Blunt Man and Chronic to do this." Uh, we come back to Holden for more of his stuff with uh, Ethan, and then there's a scuffle. Holden looks over, freaks out, runs over. It's a uh, uh, Banky choking Scott Mosier and screaming at each other. I'll trace a chalk liner on your fucking body. <laughs> <laughs> they separate them. They remove Mosier, the pol- the police or whatever security. And uh, Holden's like, remember, it's almost closing time. Just hold it together. Let's get out of here. Uh, from there, we jump to a, a Manhattan Comic Con panel. This one has Hooper X on it, who, who's on the stage right now, uh, leading the sermon, if you will. Uh, Alyssa Jones on the panel, and a couple of other people who don't matter at all. But a packed room. Uh, Banky and Holden come in and sit down as all this is happening, and Holden's up there. Rant, or I'm sorry, uh, Hooper's up there ranting and raving in his character, right? Of uh, uh, the very strong, very angry and militant black man. Uh, just wanna, promoting, his book, promoting his book, White Hate and Coon. Yeah. I just wanted to say that this is one of my favorite scenes in all of the View Askew universe because it's just, it's so funny and so well executed. It's, well, it's actually, I'm oh, sorry, go, go ahead. I was going to say, it's, it's, it's a perfect example of, like, the movie, right? Which is that you are – you're sitting there going, oh, my God, these guys are terrible. And then it turns out in the end, yeah. you're like, oh, no, they weren't so terrible. This was, a, this was like, a thing. Yeah. Exactly. And it's also – if you have the DVD or the means, and I'm sure they're online, you should go watch the outtakes because these are some of my favorite outtakes of uh, all the Kevin Smith movies outtakes I've watched. of just Ben Affleck and Jason Lee just not being able to hold it together. <laughs> 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 That's hogwash. Uh, but great stuff. And just, again, showing their friendship on set as they did all this stuff. Um Anyways, like I say, uh, Hooper's up there giving a sermon about how his book, you know, is, you know, that comics have always uh, put uh, black people in supporting roles, true, and given them shitty names, true, that are just about their race, true. And like that, that's why in his book, it's not like that. He's, you know, this descendant of these warriors. He's there fucking shit up. He's awesome, whatever. Uh, at which point, I forget what the initial thing is that, ca- that he says something, which Jason Lee gets, uh, or no, Ben Affleck shouts out, right? Of like, there's positive depictions of, uh, uh, black people in science fiction. Uh, Lando Calrissian is a great example. And then it's right into how Lando Calrissian is a terrible example of a uh, positive role model of a black character in uh, science fiction that he's just, you know, he's just there as like the co-pilot. He's the second hand guy. It doesn't really matter or whatever. This leads to an entire run of Star Wars now where we're into this of how insulting Star Wars is in general, right? Uh, that yeah, this cracker farm boy, Luke Skywalker, decides he picks up a lightsaber, decides he's going to run the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few great, there's some great stuff back and forth in here with Jason Lee, right? I'm like, what do you call that? Intergalactic Civil War? <laughs> Why the Persian? <laughs> and they go in and then it's uh, to the line of uh, Hooper's getting angry and angry and angry as he goes <laughs> and finally the, the line yeah of like uh you know in uh jedi is the most insulting of the trilogy uh you know they've built up vader to have this beautiful black visage uh but at the end when they t- take it out take off his helmet he's this old crusty white guy they're saying they saying deep inside we all wants to be white and there's a beat and jason lee stands up well isn't that true <laughs> he pulls out a gun <laughs> takes over the podium shoots jason. It's like a pop cap gun you know again you right. talk about the budget here right or whatever how do you make this look good at all Shoots Jason Lee. Jason Lee falls over dead. Ben Affleck sits there. The entire room empties. Everybody runs away screaming. Um, Hooper walks over there and, and uh, taps him on the hat to wake him up, say it's over. And it's like, what the Nubian bitch? You almost made me laugh. 
big <laughs> shout out to you, of course, our br- our friend. Uh, uh, I would say br- I was going to say bro, but we barely know him. But he was on uh, E3 the one time. I love when I listen to the Murs album, Have a Nice Life. There's a section in there, and one of his songs he goes, "What's a Nubian?" All right, because he's a Kevin Smith fan too. Um, and then he's like, "You didn't tell me you're going to scream Black Rage." I nearly shot <laughs> <laughs> Black Rage, Black Rage. He's using the Scott. Um, Hooper stands up, Banky stands up, Holden stands up. We are, are revealed here, right, that uh, uh, Hooper X is not this uh, militant, angry black man. He is a gay black man who's very nice and, like, as we already said, like the moral compass of this movie and really great, even though he's flawed as well, as we've already stated as well. Uh, they talk a little bit about that great line here that, again, is a product of the times that gets thrown away. I think now he's like, we're holding, looks around and goes, shouldn't the police be busting in right now and smashing open your head? And Jason Lee stands up and goes, wrong coast. Because that was, you know, L.A. Riot, Rodney King, all that stuff, whatever. Um, and while they talk, uh, the one and only Alyssa Jones makes her entrance to the film, walking over and, and saying, How, why is it, Hooper, that on stage you sound like Mir- uh, Minister Farrakhan, but off stage you sound like the King of Pop? Uh, he goes, careful, guys, this kitten's got claws. They jump around. She's screaming at him for like, hey, what the uh, next time I'm on a panel, like, can I talk before you empty the room and do all these different things? Um Introductions are made, of course. This is a small indie uh, panel. That's why they're on it. Blunt Man and Chronic sell, outsells both their books combined. Uh, they're down here slumming it with us or whatever. Uh, immediately, there's a little bit of a spark there between uh, Holden. Uh, they're invited out for drinks, and uh, Banky says no. Holden says yes. Holden looks at Banky, and Banky's like, fine, we'll go. Uh, we cut across the street there at uh, – we join the mid-conversation, which the thrust of – you're insane. Archie isn't fucking Mr. Weatherby. <laughs> so good. About how Arthi, uh, Ar- Archie is a uh, closeted gay man as well in his own comic books. And everyone around the table badgering Banky about it, who is uh, very uh, insistent on uh, Archie being a heterosexual character, talking about how he, he had Betty and Veronica. He, he was trying to get them into threesome when they were like, no, he couldn't choose. All these different things they bad for. <laughs> a great one that I can't believe I've never put into my repertoire. But eventually, while Banky is continuing to spin his wheels and argue, Hooper takes out a dollar and fl- flails it in front of his face. It's like, what is that? It's a dollar. Go, go to the go to the corner store and buy yourself a clue. Um, this angers B- Banky finally to the point of standing up and going, all right, we're marching back to the Comic-Con. We're going to buy a shitload of Archie books, and I'm going to prove to you that Archie is all about the pussy. Uh, Hooper's like, fine, I'll engage, and he goes. Uh, Alyssa and Holden are left alone. Uh, they have a few beers. Uh, they start bullshitting around and eventually move over to darts. Uh, over there, they're playing darts in front of the the bathroom, uh, chatting it up about comic books and life and uh, what's going on. She's excited if anybody reads her book or whatever. It's not the most like I don't see the sparks flying here as much as others would, but Holden's got enough of a he's he's into this right. Uh, he glances outside. Also, it's probably like the most expensive scene. Like they had to have a dartboard in front of a camera, which is huge, <laughs> huge big budget stuff <laughs> for Kevin. I, I respect that movie. they were throwing the darts. If they, if that were reality, you'd be like, why are those people throwing the darts at waist level? Yeah. It's like throwing them like, right <laughs> underneath the camera. Yeah. And so quickly too. Is that a thing? Like, I don't know how to properly play They weren't even keeping darts. score. They weren't, I played, they weren't keeping score. I played they darts in Final more. Fantasy. Something that I thought yeah. was weird was she seemed good at darts, right? Yeah. Like she was kind of like hitting that, that bullseye a couple times. And then later in the movie, like she hacks like the the uh ski ball thing was like some foreign science i have yeah, never seen ski ball totally before different mechanics it's really yeah, weird to me i feel like you this is also the first bar, place right? that ski ball was explained to me before that it was just this mystery thing of like i guess i'm gonna jump on this table walk up and put it in the hundred that was that's what you did that's how you play it the first time. <laughs> yeah, you get all the tickets. Tim, back me up. He's that's, right. Yeah, Santa Cruz, that's what we used to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then they'd catch um, you and yell. While they're playing darts or whatever and having this conversation, Holden looks outside and there's a, a, a I was gonna say husband and wife. No, just a couple making out furiously on top of Banky's car. Um, and he's like, Oh, that's and it's this conversation about that. Gives you a charge, right? That there's still love out there. They're they're in love. Alyssa's is like that's not love that's fleeting uh it's a little bit of a, a glimpse into her you know uh, take on love and holding thinking that everything's gonna be hunky-dory all the time and whatever yada yada yeah uh eventually though she looks at her watch she's got to go tell hooper i'll call him tomorrow holden says all right and she leaves she leaves through the front door and somehow holden <laughs> i'm sorry banky and hooper come through the back apparently with a bunch of fucking archie books <laughs> so they walk in 
And then, see, Mr. Weatherby's just offering Archie to help with his homework. Read between the lines, bitch. Uh, and there's this conversation real quick from Hooper and uh, 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 Holden about, yeah, you know, this is cool or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Um, from there, right, uh, they go home. Uh, we are back in Leonardo, New Jersey, right? Uh, 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 we, I think this is where we establish a shot of uh, hold up or bank hold up studios or whatever uh, upstairs in their house, which is also their studio studio both so uh, nice huh this is so nice they're like there are there's studios a house space or whatever it it's really a really cool, cool well-designed yeah. space yeah. yeah like when you have when you have brick walls and stuff and like oh, cool giant, furniture like, like yeah, you, posters and stuff you guys are living it up dude. it's yeah. so 90s though everything yeah. is a furniture and this thing is so yeah. it reminds me when i first started at ign and they had all that shit furniture left over from the 90s yeah. we were like huh somebody the made an orange ass. shaped moon <laughs> chair that's the thing someone did <laughs> uh yeah they're working on blunt man and chronic uh you know holden is in fact drawing banky is in fact inking there's a great line in there of like uh, i really like these uh well, i really like these lamp posts where are they from he's like the post office they're the best you've ever done okay cool phone rings holden picks it up uh oh he actually uh, before that i'm sorry he says what do you want to do tonight and uh, uh holden's like what do you want to do tonight bank he's like get a pizza and watch uh, degrassi he's got i got a weird thing for girls who say a boot phone rings he uh, holden picks it up it's uh hooper Hooper is calling uh, to invite them to a party in the city where he's tending bar. Uh, Holden is like, I don't know, probably not. We you know we have a big meeting tomorrow, which will be a thing that comes up here as a plot point in a second. Um, and Hooper, of course, knowing exactly what he's doing, even though he doesn't want to do it, uh, says, I told her you'd say that. Wait, told who? Alyssa. Alyssa wanted me to invite you. So now here's the part where you say we'll be there. Uh, hangs up. They're going to go to this thing in the city or whatever. Um, we go there. It's a club called the Meow Mix. Uh, Hooper is, in fact, tending bar. Uh, Binky walks in and says, bring on the free. Ho-. Oh, there was a fun thing where Ben Affleck dances around uh, uh, Jason Lee's uh, character and is like, we, 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 we shared a moment. Oh, you had a moment. No, we shared a moment. And then he starts doing this weird cabbage patch dance, dance around uh, Binky as he draws whatever. We then cut to Meow Mix where Binky comes in, bring on the free hooch. Who invited your ass? Uh, then Holden walks up and he's dancing too. What a Still great like, name for a bar. Same. Meow Mix. Meow Mix. So then, then he, he's like, he, he's like, where's Alyssa? He, she's been on the dance floor. She's been dancing an hour. Hasn't stopped yet. Uh, he's going to go join her. Uh, Hooper's like, hold up a sec. Before you do, we should talk. And he's like, does she have a boyfriend? And, and he's like, well, no, not exactly. And he's like, what's to know? What's to know? And he heads off there to uh, go dance out there. And so he walks over or dances over, bumps into Alyssa on purpose, does the funny fake yell at her. They start hitting it off and talking. And this is where it's revealed that uh, Alyssa is actually from his hometown. Like he's like, wait a second. You, you, I heard you were from here. I am from there. But, you know, and then it, but then it's this weird thing of like, oh, how Jersey are you or whatever? And he starts giving her the quiz. Right. Uh, and so it was all right. Quick stop. My best friend fucked a dead guy in the bathroom. You knew that girl? So of course, right? <laughs> also, I love that we get a little backstory for her that she's currently in an insane asylum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, uh, I was like, oh, okay. You knew that girl? Yeah, until she was committed. <laughs> yeah, guess, so, guess right, Dante yeah. didn't get back together with her after all. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe he's a good guy. So uh, with this up, so one of uh, Alyssa Jones' sisters, uh, according to Smith's View Askew Productions' official synopsis of Chasing Amy is Heather Jones, uh, the woman in Clerks who asked Rick Darris for a ride to the beach from the quick stop. Alyssa's youngest sister is Trisha Jones, the 15-year-old sex book author in Mallrats. Trisha had sex with Affleck's character Shannon Hamilton in the movie. Uh, Alyssa in Chasing Amy says she had sex with Shannon Hamilton when she was in college. Which yeah. is hilarious because it's – Yeah, I mean this Shannon one, fucking Hamilton. This is super Shannon. right. This movie is where they try to – they do so Connect many all. connections to all these different people and all the things that, yeah, who fuck to. And it's, so brain, it's brain bending though because I was like, Shannon Hamilton. No, that's not Shannon Doherty's. No, that's no. <laughs> Ben Affleck's character from the other thing. But Ben Affleck said here. I don't understand it. Um. So then, yeah, that's revealed, right? And then it was uh, – is also revealed. He's like, well, man, you know, do you ever go back? And she's like, no, I haven't been back since my, uh, my other friend's funeral uh, the the girl who fucked the dead guy died no this one died in the ymca pool and he cuts her off and says it too right of like and then he has a great line here that i'll fuck up but he's like man one in the asylum one in the grave you're a dangerous person to know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh and so yeah they are hitting it off here talk catching up about uh jersey life or whatever and while this happens the music stops the singer i guess or whoever's up there on stage uh, introduces the fact that they used to have a bass player who had these ideas that she could sing but she left 
have to go make funny books. Uh, if we real nice, we can get Alyssa to come up here and saying Alyssa is very uh, uh, shy about it. You know, huddles in Ben Affleck's chest. Then she's like, all right, I'll go up there. She goes up there. She starts saying, I want to feel passion. I want to feel pain. Uh, what, just, a, just, a, just a great singer, too. Glad the scene goes on so long. <laughs> For 10 hours. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, why would they make Joey Lauren Adams sing? Like, maybe he, she was like, I really want to sing. And he was like, you're my girlfriend. I can't like, say no to sure, you. But whatever girlfriend. you want. She they is had, not a great singer. I'll tell you that. They had to drive the point home of, like, that the fake out. And, and while watching this scene, I kept thinking – why, what's up with this fucking blonde girl in this shot? Get like, why is she here? <laughs> Move. Like, so like, works, you know direct. <laughs> because they kept on showing Banky looking at her, and, like eyeing her down and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, they did that once, and now they're continuing to do this. What? Why is this going on for so long? <laughs> and yeah. the happens, and I was like, oh shit! <laughs> like I had no idea. So that caught you off guard, Tim? Did yeah. that catch you off guard? Yeah. It it definitely would have caught me off guard if Gia and Joey didn't spoil it for me, like as it was happening. Oh. But I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know until the reveal that yeah that was, that was and the reveal of course is that as this happens yeah and by the way Banky walks up as Alyssa goes up he walks over with this shit eating grin on his face acting all happy and then Holden looks at him and he just drops it and he smokes a cigarette and yeah he I he I fucks this girl who was cuts in front of him uh Alyssa's up there she eventually she dedicated this song to that special someone uh she ends the song does one of these deals and Holden who's been dancing terribly and super awkwardly like this like, you know what I mean? Like, I, get, I can't judge it as an actor. I'm sure Kevin Smith's like, just fucking dance sexy for an hour. And he's like, I don't fucking know what to do. Well, I, I, don't know if it was, I don't know if it was supposed to be dance sexy or I, I kind of read it like he was being goofy. I, I, I thought know. it was that too, but then there was part of it. Nick Rawls like, I don't know if he's trying to be goofy. I think this yeah. is goofy. <laughs> Well, I mean, we didn't confirm it until we have that similar scene. Have you seen that deleted scene from Batman v Superman where he's dancing just like that? I'm no. joking. I was just totally joking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be amazing. He's in the bad series, like boom. <laughs> <laughs> that one I'd pay to see. Uh, she motions uh, for him. It is not the woman in front. Kim runs over, starts furiously making out with uh, Alyssa, and there's this great siren song sound effect they start playing, and you see Holden's spirits get crushed. Banky spirits rise and start the giant fucking slow clap. Then Banky has the moment of like, wait a second, and looks around and notices it's a million lesbians kissing all around him, which of course so parallels that scene in The Simpsons that was getting shouted around here where Homer's looking for a new bar and goes to a lesbian bar and they, they play it out like he doesn't know it's a lesbian bar except for the end when he looks around and he's like, wait a second, there's no fire exit. <laughs> Enjoy your death <laughs> trap, ladies. And ladies. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's Genius. It's this reveal, yeah, that the Meow Mix is in fact a lesbian or at least gay bar. Uh, and what are we gonna do? And so now we cut to a back booth of it, even though it looks like a different place in a restaurant, but whatever. This is the one we were talking about earlier. It was gonna be in Mall Rats, but wasn't this year. Instead, now it's yeah, Holden and Banky, uh, Alyssa and Kim. Alyssa and Kim are making out furiously. Banky's staring. It's back to what I was talking about. Holden hits them. What are we gonna see this stuff without paying for it? Uh, Alyssa finally turns around and is like, does some shit. And Kim's like, I wanna go dance. I wanna dance with you. And she's like, no, you're gonna go out there and like, you know, uh, I wanna watch you dance out there so I can work up the desire to fuck you. And he, she leaves and Banky's just still staring. She's like, what? He's like, fuck. You said fuck. You wanna fuck her. But how do you fuck her? And again, it's, I think, a, totally think of thing like what why would that be hung up but in 97 no, there's not that many lesbians out there who are having these conversations at least to stupid straight people from the suburbs but again that's one of those that's one of those conversations where you're like you 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 remember having stupid conversations like that and those were hills that you would die on sure. and again you start peeling away why he's doing this yep. and it's it's again the insecurity of being a guy and realizing that there are these two women you're attracted to who that don't, don't need are you. not attracted to you <laughs> yeah. and so you have to sort of like find a flaw in them so you can feel better about yourself because you're not needed in this situation and so, yeah, this kicks off the long and detailed conversation that uh, ramps up from sex to the sexual stories, right? And it, and I, obviously, we all saw the movie, so you know how it works. And I, I think it's endearing, and I do think we get – it's the same thing that I think I, – I, I remember being 18 and two adults trying to explain Kevin Smith movies – and then being hung up on how crude it was. Or when I mentioned Dogma, and we won't do future spoilers, but I mentioned Dogma. Oh, the one that makes fun of the church. And I'm like, that's on the surface what it all looks like. Yes. But beneath that, like, he is a Catholic. You know, it, beneath this thing, right, of, like, them throwing around slurs and acting all – he's trying to give you a message of, like, this is just normal. Why is it not normal to you kind of thing and ease you into it? Um, 
but it starts away and like just, uh, there's a whole bunch of different stuff in here but i, I love when it, so do you sex is penetration he's like well yeah well you know, and he's like well so so you banky sex is you're on you're on top of some girl jackhammering away never noticing the the, the disinterested look in her eyes he goes he's hey, like, hey i always notice the <laughs> <laughs> like such a great fucking line <laughs> but it is this you know of course uh ever escalating thing of what sex is what penetration is uh which then leads to it's it, a, a moment between uh, Banky and Alyssa where they seem like they're on okay cool common ground or whatever and then he's like it's the whole thing of like that's why I stopped going down on girls this starts a whole new thing of like being self-conscious right and he stopped doing it because he can't do it right and if he's not going to do it right uh you know why do it and, he, and, and she's like well it's your shortcoming and he's like no it's not it's the girls and it's this thing of how girls are too shy in his experience to tell you what they want so it isn't a good experience and I, like, like Throughout this whole conversation, I just keep thinking this movie were made today. Ryan Reynolds would absolutely be banky. Like just like a lot of the mannerisms, a lot of the way that his speech patterns and his like inflections. It just reminds me so much of Ryan Reynolds, like the higher pitch voice, too. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and so, yeah, then Ellis is like, well, you know, um, yeah, well, he's like, you know, the weather channel on CNN, constant updates. And she's like, no, nah, you know, I'm like a guy at the airport with the cones, flashing him in, waving him out, telling him to stop. Um, and so then this is where we turn the corner to really getting into, you know, he doesn't want to do this because of permanent injuries. What do you mean permanent injuries? And this is when he opens his mouth, shows a cracked uh, molar, of course, because he was going down on a girl and her cat jumped across and she went like that, hit him in the pelvis, cracked it. He, swa- she swa- he swallowed uh, the tooth. It's back to Alyssa Wright, who I think her first story was the one where she gets uh, the stiletto heel on her side from passing out. Uh. Yeah. I think it might be She's Caitlin Bree's laugh, yeah. or maybe she was going, you're right. That's the Caitlin no, Bree. I, I don't think that was the that was the Caitlin Bree story. She, I think, in this has a Caitlin Bree story, and later she alludes to like talking. Well, about no, 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 yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I'm with you there. I'm, yeah, yeah. This I, it's I either this one or the one where it's the spring formal back of the car going down on somebody that hit the parking brake and it goes and cuts up her knees like kitty scissors. I, um, I think that you. might have been Caitlin Bree. That's literally what I'm saying. It's okay. one of those two stories. Uh, then Banky tells the story of Brandy Svenning, of course, uh, TS's girlfriend slash wife from Mallrats, uh, of how, yeah, he was going down on her. She did something different. Her legs pressed against his ears. Her dad walked in, yanked his head back. He can no longer turn his head any further than this to the right. Um, and so they're having a great time, and they're catching up and sharing these stories. And then they get to this really forced laughing at the kitty scissors thing. Oh, I hate that. It's I just so clear that Jason Lee is not really laughing, even though Banky is supposed supposed to be really laughing and again i'm sure this is take 74 and it's like whatever let's okay. move on <laughs> but also nobody laughs that hard for that <laughs> long unless you literally do greg <laughs> miller's okay so bad fuck off so bad <laughs> um, however at this point holden has heard enough and he's like let's go we got to get out of here traffic and he's like what traffic it's 1 30 in the morning <laughs> it's a call back to when banky wanted to leave the manhattan Con- convention at a normal hour i was like traffic uh they leave uh, Kim comes back and Alyssa looks over at longingly at holding like mm, this didn't go the way it should have. Um, the next day, Banky and Holden have their big comic book uh, meeting about Blunt Man and Chronic at MTV, right? They're in the lobby and there's, you know, a very uh, graphic conversation that happens there in the front of the receptionist who looks over and is all offended. They then go in to meet and talk about an animated series that MTV would like to do with uh, Blunt Man and Chronic. And of course, who is in the room as the executives? It is a one and only Brian O'Halloran. Uh, you would know him as Dante from Clerks or Gil from Mallrats and Matt Damon. Matt Damon, <laughs> just like two lines, right? Like new movie. Leaning on a chair. Yep. He'd go on to write Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> Literally, like two years later. Yeah. yeah. He was probably Very in the certain. process of writing it then. Memory serves from the commentary, right? Like, that was totally just a favor to Ben, where Ben's like, my friend Matt, can you just have something in the film? And Kevin's like, yeah, whatever. You can sit on this fucking desk and be the other guy. All right, thank you, whatever. Uh, the idea, of course, that these guys are fucking suits. They don't understand art. They're monsters. Uh, but they want to make, what is it, 12 episodes, half-hour episodes of Blunt Man and Chronic, which would get them a lot of money or whatever. Um, I'm going to say Snoochie Boochies, and it's all creepy. Uh, from there, we go back to the house, and there's a knock at the door. They uh, Holden opens the door. It is the one and only Alyssa Jones, who is here. Hey, did I make comic books here? I have a great idea for a comic book. These people are out there having a great time, but it, but it turns out that this woman is gay, and he whoo, hightails it out. Would you be interested in that story? And so I then, love this. I love yeah, that. no, and it's like really, you know, again, you want to talk about, I think, how mature and well rounded the character of Alyssa is, right? Of like, 
I like you. You seem like a cool person. You're offended by my lifestyle. Let's talk about that. Or something doesn't click about my lifestyle. Let's actually yeah. do this rather than do just you think you that, like she thought he was offended by it? I like she didn't realize that he liked her or that I mean, wanted more. Because I kind of feel like it doesn't yeah. add up in this movie. That's the one thing that I'm like, it seems like it's very clear that he liked her and he wanted to have either a physical or a romantic relationship with her right from the beginning. Like he was flirty. There was a lot of flirting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She from seemed like yeah. she liked it. She liked it too. It seemed like it was going both ways. Like the scene that we get where they're at the bar, she, they're definitely flirting back and forth, right? Um, and then like, why, why does she continue to keep like trying to have a relationship where it's like, I just don't feel like... Like it's well, I think she what talks wants. this out. She talks this out in bed with him, right? Where he's like, "This jumping ahead, he is like, why me?" And she's like, "It goes through a very long process, but eventually gets to." Yeah, but the, the, I stopped closing that, closing myself off to you because I realized that's the whole reason I went down this path of being gay in the first but place. But I, I always assume that that is a conversation, or like that—that's a decision she made after she fell in love with him, after they would spent all this time together, and after the big fight. Yeah. Well, yeah, but again, I don't think I, I hear you. Like, I think because I don't saying, think right hey, now she's knocking on the door trying to be in a relationship with him. Or, you know, <laughs> you don't. You know, I I read it like she was like, "Hey, we're we're colleagues. I wanted to get to know yeah. you. You were friends. Like, I want to be your friend. Yeah, you seem like a cool guy. I want to be a friend. Yeah, that with. just seems. Yeah, that that always seemed really unrealistic. In that, like, well, but that's but that's like kind of the point, right? Is that uh, why is it unrealistic to you? Because, because two it's just adults don't go that after she you. Wouldn't like, get yeah. the signs. Yeah, like but like. If well, someone... like I understand that, but like also, you know, they're con- they're like he has a popular comic book. Maybe she's just trying to network. Maybe she's just trying to be his friend. Maybe they're like, you know, they have so many other things in common, and maybe she felt bad for like him not realizing what was going on the night prior. Like I, I'm are... with Kevin too, where I don't think I don't think she has an interest in him. She might maybe she maybe there is a little bit of a chemistry there, but I don't think that that spark becomes a fire until like like Way later later in this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I never saw I it as on this topic of conversation because I thought Kevin introduced it, but then he said no, that's not what he feels. I don't. How do we even get here? Wait, I, yeah, no, no. I no. I think we got here by by saying that. Uh, are are we confused that Alyssa is like? Hey, you're offended that I'm a lesbian, or hey, you're offended because you thought we were flirting and we actually weren't. No, no, I, I was just saying like this is a moment in the, in the movie where it's like, why would Alyssa come to his door? Like, why would she go out of her way to hang out with someone who like clearly wants something that she doesn't want from? Like, it, it just seems this this well, moment I and they're, they're I I understand that like for the movie to happen, we need them yeah, to continue yeah. their relationship, well, but I just wish they had done it a little bit differently. I I just feel like if this were modern times and he was a well-adjusted human being, he would have realized, oh, she's gay. She's not into me. And then they could have been friends. And I think that was <laughs> maybe the concept that he was shooting for. Yeah, there but he's I, like, I do well, feel you like... should like it's not her fault that no. he's into her, right? Yeah, but and so like, I think she owes him a, not an apology, but like wants to clarify that and be like, "Hey, I still want to." Be I feel a like we're adding life. a lot to it. I feel like this is an example of just like they needed the plot to happen right. to have hold and have these growths and stuff, but that like she is just a thing to make the plot go forward with this, where it doesn't actually add up. Okay, well, we leave the house and we go on a walkabout uh, outside in New, New Jersey, the burbs of uh, New Jersey. And uh, we eventually end up, uh, you know, walking to a swing set and a playground, hanging out there and having a heart to heart between Holden and Alyssa, which is very much she says here, like, you know, she likes him and wants him to be comfortable uh, with her sexuality and stuff. So he can ask questions. And so he asked some questions about, yeah, again, penetration. And it's very much the 1997 super, well, I mean, not super, I guess you put it that way, but like traditional hetero man of like i don't understand this I understand that like you know what i mean like what are we talking about here how big can the tongue get and they get into all that jazz right but even she got a big tongue she, she got, got a big, big old fat tongue big old fat tongue just having the conversation and talking it out this one thing so they can be friends because she wants to be friends she says uh she makes her intentions clear um and it's this you know conversation about his sexual experiences how she broke her hymen on a fence post there's they start doing this like on the record off the record stricken from the record thing as they talk through and again it's an endearing conversation i feel that for me i always just read it that yes she there i think that there's a spark between them that she didn't take as romantic but she also is in this place in 1997 where she wants to explain who she is and you 
turn more hearts with honey than vinegar kind of thing. But she comes out and says all that. And she wants to make sure you talk to him and feel it, you know, talk about all the stuff, whatever. So they do. She does. Uh, we also get the introduction here, right, where they're talking of like uh, she Holden recaps the meeting with the MTV execs. And she's like, well, that's great. And he's like, yeah, thank you. Think so. She and she's like, you don't. And he's like, I don't want to sound pretentious, which he completely does. But like he always wanted to make more art than this. And is this what they're really doing and what they're really contributing? And like this is the line, I think, too, right, of like. You know, I want to do something more like our first book, my first book that was personal. When when are you going to do something like that? I guess when I have something personal to say. And that, I might be confusing this. That might happen in the next montage. But for all intents and purposes, it happens right here. Um, but before that, oh, well, more happens, let me tell you about our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're brought to you by Honey. Online shopping is supposed to be easy. So why is it so hard to find coupon codes that actually work? Let me tell you, it doesn't need to be hard anymore. It's actually very, very simple, thanks to Honey. It doesn't have to be hard at all. Honey is the free online shopping tool that saves you money online. Honey automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart, which makes online shopping finally feel as easy as it's supposed to. Um, you just go to your favorite sites, whether it's Target, Best Buy, Sephora, Macy's, eBay, all the way down to like Etsy and random other things. Thousands of sites are covered with this, and you're just saving money. Um, I recently got some sweet deals on some Hue lights um, from Best Buy thanks to this, saving cash, and it couldn't be simpler. Just two clicks, you're installing this in your browser, and it automatically does it all for you, and it's just saving you money. Honey's found over 18 million members, over $2 billion in savings, and uh, they support over 30,000 stores online. They're adding more every day. Um, not using Honey's literally passing up free money. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. You can get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash morning. That's joinhoney.com slash morning. Back to it, Sir Gregory. Got a package while you were going looking in here. Wow. Something good? Frozen uh, meats? Video game stuff. It said Halo, but it's not Halo. Instead, it's for that shark man-eater game. So there's a whole bunch of stuff over here. I'll look into it later. Oh, <laughs> shark man-eater game. The one where you play as the shark. Hmm. Also, Kevin, can you move your camera? Because you're just so low in your frame. You know, here's the thing. If I do that, if I do that, the camera's going to tilt that way, and there's no way to make it not tilt that way. Look. No, no, I believe you. It wasn't. (laughs) You see? (laughs) And then I I try for like two minutes to fix it. Wait, hold on. It's fine. Um, So now, of course, uh, Banky and Holden are at the train station. They're getting ready to go on another comic convention signing thingamajig. Um, While they're waiting there, Holden comments on Banky's bag. Banky's like, all right, I want to get one thing for my bag. He opens it up, and it's just stacks and stacks of porno mags. This man has a problem. Holden just has the fucking great line of like, who who are you, Larry fucking Flint? <laughs> Nick, was was it like this when you were growing up? You just had to carry uh, bags and bags times. of porn. It was the dark times. I, I used to have to. I used to have to draw my own porn. That's how bad it got. No. Oh God, you are really yeah. good at drawing. So I I've believe seen that. you draw porn. <laughs> it's horrifying. You know, I'm gonna draw one for you right now. Yeah, no, no, no please. Right last now. time. Um. So. You know, while they go through this and Banky's explaining, he brings uh, all these porno mags because he never knows what mood he's going to be in, which, of course, ends in uh, that he could be into bestiality. <laughs> like, that's the final thing. I'm like, I might want to see a girl fuck a horse. And it's like, huh, okay. Um, meanwhile, it happens, though. Uh, Holden gets a page from the one and only Alyssa Jones, his master's voice. He runs over to the payphone, calls her. She makes a reference to the fact that, you know, minute 30 seconds, you are so my bitch. And it's basically like, Hey, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to this convention. Oh, shit. I was coming back to New Jersey uh, with my sisters. We're going to go see our parents or whatever. He's like, fuck, I want to, she want, I want to hang out with you. Holden immediately like folds of like, well, you know what? This is just a stupid signing. There's no like panels or appearances or whatever. Bank, you could do it. Uh, if you pick me up, I'll be your best friend. Just fucking uh, bails. Dude, <laughs> like, what, a, what an totally, asshole. Totally, totally he's not just bails. Him, also, is this where she, he's like, oh, your sister that wrote the book? It might be, but yeah, yeah I mean that that's that, cool, that reference somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, a, that's right. a reference I didn't get till this time. Oh it was really? Like, oh shit, that's a what you call her? Trish, Trish yeah. the dish. Nobody calls me that. Uh, um, oh, go ahead. I sure? have a real big problem with this next scene. <laughs> okay, uh, Holden cut- goes over to Banky and says, "I'm gonna stay. Uh, Liz is coming to town. I want to hang out with her." Uh, Banky's clearly pissed off or whatever, but Holden doesn't give a shit, and he's just like, "Listen, just go there, plug the annual. Don't mention the cartoon. I'll pick you up at the train station 9 p.m." Uh, Wait, no, hold, hold on. Banky is showing the porn oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. to a child. And then black, 
<laughs> Black Beauty decided to do some mounting of her own. Jesus fun. fucking I, cr- bestiality too. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> oh my but god, that's a horror. Like, on, years. That's kids got to learn at some point. Am I right, Greg? Yeah, no, nah, no, no, no. This is a really fucked learn- up scene that I actually don't like at all. I'd rather he learn than the way I learned, which was Nick showing it to me. Oh, um, man. Oh, man. <laughs> IRL. Yeah, we just went over to the local horse farm. I said, Greg. <laughs> oh, my God. Jesus Jesus I didn't. Well, I don't think he meant that, that you did it, but, you know. No, like, <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> Oh my god. So instead what happens uh Banky leaves on the train, uh Holden and Alyssa start hanging out. This is when they go play ski ball. As you pointed out, she's never heard of ski ball. This is also the introduction of the uh the insult potzer, uh which I think is a New Jersey turn of phrase. <clears throat> That Holden drops on her for never having done this. He's like, what did you do with your high school years? There's, you know, you're back and forth here, you know, smoke drugs, got laid, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, they, he explains ski ball to her. Why not walk up there and put it in the hole? She's like, well, or, or he's like, that's too simple, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they go to do the first thing, ski ball, and this is a game of skill. And again, this is all just Kevin Smith bantering, right, as they, their relationship deepens and everything else. Uh, as he goes to throw, right, and he's like, what did you do last night? She's like, got laid. And he loses his mind that she had fucking lesbian sex last night. <laughs> Throws the ball across the thing, smashes a pinball table. She's like, that's some of the skill you were talking about? And then we just get a fucking jam as we get into a montage. <laughs> This high, never can Ambolina play this? <laughs> and so it's uh, Holden and Alyssa, as multiple weeks of friendship uh, continue to evolve and they hang out nonstop. Uh, it's him reading a magazine in the park and her being bored and her replacing herself with a child. It's uh, them so watching weird. her That's dragging weird. him to a subway station and falling down, him flexing over her. It's uh, him making the naked lesbian cake for her. It's them just going back and forth. Was it, and- was it a naked lesbian cake or was that supposed to be her naked? I think it was her. That's what I It just seems like an escalation. Like. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, you know, I wouldn't you know make Lucy James a naked cake of herself. Oh, you know I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm working on that naked cake for you, Greg, of just the horse in me. <laughs> Nick, <laughs> none of what you just said made any sense. <laughs> is it me and the horse or is it just a naked horse? Is the horse me. inside you? God. Uh, me and the horse just hanging out at a Starbucks naked. <laughs> <laughs> of course the horse is naked. Look at the look on Andy's face. That's the best part of this whole thing. Look Tim, at Andy's sometimes horses face wear face clothes. Right Cop horses always know. wear clothes. Oh, Jesus, God. Nigga. Andy looks like he's caught in a prison fight. He's just trying to figure out how to survive right now. <laughs> um, so this is when so the montage is great. And you see clearly Holden is falling in love. You, does she have feelings? We don't really know. You assume not, but who knows? Um, this is yes. when we come. Huh? Oh, I was saying I assumed yes. Yeah, I think right. It, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it seems it's, like this, these are all it's coupley cute, things, like let it's alone. Cool. Her, like, not hanging out with any of her crew, right? That we don't know yet, but yeah, in general. Yeah, we'll get that like, later. Um, so then, yeah, Holden comes home, or, yeah, and Banky's playing at Sega. This is what we were talking about earlier, where he sits down next to him, and uh, he calls the whalers a bunch of Fs. And, uh, and then it's uh, Holden drops the, like, you know, you really shouldn't do that. What? You know, gay bash. You know, it's bad enough that you're mad at the video game that you need to gay bash it, but you don't, or that you want to yell at him. You don't need to gay bash it. And blah, blah, blah. And he goes on a little bit more about, like, how he's a good person at heart, but, like, you know, he should be careful what he says. And he gets up and leaves. And this is when Banky gives Chase back to the ta- over there. He's like, what what the fuck's wrong with you? She's programming you. He's like, what do you mean? Her and the little pink mafia or whatever, yada, yada, yada. Uh, they argue about this uh, being programmed. And, what, and what's the matter if I want to call the whalers a bunch of Fs in my house and uh, privacy in my hallway or the sensitive ears of the world? Um, they continue to escalate this argument. And finally, uh, Banky grabs a comic page that's blank and draws a four-way street, putting a lipstick uh, lesbian as he calls it um uh man hating ball breaking dyke or whatever he calls it uh definitely using the d word uh then santa and the easter money <laughs> and he's like but this is a crisp 100 hundred dollar bill in the center who would get to it first and uh hold in he, he, he's like what is this he's like it's thought exercise really it's like an sat question what would happen who gets it first and he's like the man hating dyke and he's like right why i don't know because the, ra- the other three are figments of your fucking imagination and this is where I the argument like, out fucking, loud this you shit- laughed out loud it broke me. I did not like there's something about inappropriate humor that just like it always just adds that extra level. Is this an appropriate joke? No. Did it fucking break me? Yes. I legit laughed out loud where I was just like, didn't expect that because I was trying to figure out like yeah, what, what is he doing? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, that was, I thought it was real good. 
and it's interesting because it's a funny it's like a funny whatever word exercise and i think how, if you acted it and i should say act that doesn't make any sense if you performed it differently it would be funny but the ramp up of it's it was your fucking imagination and then hold them getting anxious and angry and walking around trying to find cigarettes and them arguing and arguing and arguing right of like how this is spiraling out of control and she's this and she's that and blah 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 and finally where he's they it escalates to a head right where he's like i'm fucking in love with her and banky's just like de- like just dead You're to done. it right of like yeah. well, i have no there's no plays left yeah you know what i mean he has no moves left on the board when this is what he has been said right and so and, uh, and so yeah yeah he leaves right yeah because yeah, they aren't dating yet. So he, yeah, okay. This is where he says he loves her, right, Kev? Yeah. I'm not arguing on that one because we had the other one later. You say, you say yeah, well, it looks the, a little peaky. I'll fucking pump your teeth down your throat. Yeah, that's later. Um, so right now, yeah, it's, I know that I, part's I thought later. This was anyway. like, I, I know Ben Affleck gets a lot of shit about acting, but I felt like this moment of like exploding was really good. And uh, for both of them, actually, like them going back and forth, like yeah. this seems like a real fight that like friends could have and him having this outburst of like all right this is it this is what it is and just like leave me alone finally saying it, yeah right? like it's an escalation for sure i'm trying to figure this out uh from there we go to the diner where Alyssa and holden are finishing a meal Alyssa's is still very much eating like there's a lot of food on her plate and holden's like picks up the check he's like i wish you were signing a cartoon deal or your book was selling or whatever it is so you can pick up a check once in a while and she's like are we finished because she still has food and he's like yeah it's not a bed and breakfast and she's like Hold on, I want to conduct some business. She goes over to the thing, and I could be speaking out of turn, but if I remember my chasing Amy facts correctly, this is Rip Torn's son who is working the register. If I remember that that commentary track well enough, um, Rip Torn was in uh, Wayne's World, right? I remember why he was. He was Wayne's World two. He's the one that throws glitter everywhere. Oh, the guy from Jones. Oh, no, that's not that's not Rip no, Torn. Sorry, no, Rip no. Torn's the guy from the Larry Shanley, Gary Shanley show. You're talking about um, <laughs> who am I talking about? The guy that threw glitter in Wayne's World yeah. 2 is... He was also in a... Um, Fuck. Jack Rip Torn Ash. is from Barry, right? Rip Torn? No, that's not Rip Torn. Rip Torn is passed, passed away. Passed away. He it was, was Rip, Rip Taylor. Taylor. Rip Taylor. Rip Taylor. Rip Taylor. Rip Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she Wait, wants to haggle over... Yeah. What? I was just... Nothing. Keep going. Sorry. Uh, she gets up there and she's like, are you an authorized deal maker in this industry? And he's like, what you want to, or in this uh, establishment? Establish oh, you want to haggle over the price of your French dip? No, I want to haggle over the price of fine art. There's this painting over there of these seagulls. Uh, it's listed for $75. I, what about $50 or whatever? And he looks around. He's like, Manuel, please take it off. Or Miguel, please take it off. Please take the Dicheski. Like, have you ever been to a fucking restaurant where they have fucking what? Art on the walls. If you're it's like, hard. can I buy that? They're not gonna be like, took the Dicheski or whatever the fuck off the guy. Actually, it, it, I disagree. I think that that's exactly what they do because every time I go to a restaurant in like the fucking mission that has art on the wall, I'm like, this is pretentious. Fails every, like, like every. This time. scene was so confusing to me because I did not know what they were going for. I didn't understand what the point of the scene was. The whole buying of the like, I thought there was. I thought there was something bigger that was gonna happen, like this whole haggling bullshit. And then it just turned out she just wanted to buy a painting for him. And I was very, I don't know. It just seems like I've never experienced anything where somebody's going to buy a piece of art from a restaurant. So I was very unfamiliar with what was happening. It was like a, you know, a token of the moment, right? I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I'm with you that like the scene on first watch, you're like, what is happening? And then when she explains it in the car of like, you'll always remember this moment. I was like, oh, that's actually really sweet and cool. Oh no! Tim looks, yeah, Tim looks like he broke his feet, and he has to wear like casts that look <laughs> like Gordon's. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. What the fuck? I watched the Jackie Chan movie. Like, why is his foot so fat? Oh, and you realize he broke his foot. They're like slippers, got Mars it. Oh Mars my dude. god! Anyways, anyways, back on track, back on track. <laughs> so they buy the painting, and we get in the car. Holden's driving. Alyssa's got it, and he's like, she's like, uh. He's like, where are you going to hang it? And, and she's like, no, it's where you've been hanging. He's like, oh, well, you better not let the, you know, the other gays know that you need me to come, a man to come hang a thing. She's like, no, you're going to hang it, like we just explained. This is a gift from me to you, to, you know, as a symbol of our friendship, and that way you'll never be able to forget me, yada, yada, in the time we've had. Such a and rude holding- gift. Home decor is not something you should just force on someone. If it doesn't fit his aesthetic, which no, it doesn't, have, we've seen this house. Their aesthetic is spray painted, here lies dick boy in sex room no, on the doors. No, no, there's, yeah. if she had gotten him a street sign with graffiti on it, that would have fit the aesthetic that they've set up in their house. There is an aesthetic there. He pulls over and she's like, "We're pu- why are we stopping? And this is where he, he goes into. And again, I, I you know, I, I know now it is fun to bag on Ben Affleck, right? But I do think like 
he this monologue he fucking crushes right and and, it, it, and again it's the product and time capsule of the thing of like that watching these when you're in high school and it's like man he's doing it he's laying it out and like how many times you pined for a girl and always wanted to have shot, that bro. Just laying on the line, yada yada you, you know what i mean it's like whatever he lays it all in line right and it's basically like you know i love you i love you and i know that it's fucked up and i know these different things and, blah, 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 and I, you know uh, i know i i'm I, he what is it i uh I know, and I know this will probably queer our friendship, no pun intended. Uh, but I had to say it, and I had Didn't to put like all this that. out at all. Oh, she really? just sits there. Uh, hit, that hit. line, the queer line, I was like, that that fell out of nowhere for something that I thought was very beautifully done. Yeah. I like that he was just rambling and like he kept talking because he didn't want her to respond because he saw that she wasn't yeah. going to respond well. So we just kept going and going. Yeah, and that, that to me was like the, the nervousness. Line felt too calculated for for what they were presenting there. Mm. But I, I liked the scene overall. Very yeah, totally. same here. Yeah. Ultimately, the the line of of look no no painting will yeah. like I'll like ever, of course yeah. i'm gonna remember this like i'll never really change that. yeah yeah i don't remember you uh he ends that there's a beat of silence she gets up she leaves the car it's raining by the way she gets up and leaves the car and he shuts the door and he just goes was it something i said he jumps out chases her down she's hitchhiking and you're gonna hitchhike all the way back to new- manhattan or new york or whatever and she's like yeah and he's like I, blah, blah. and she just starts laying into him right of like i'm fucking gay that's who i am it's what defines me you know what do you i'm sorry that you got a crush or whatever and uh, i'm sorry that you have a crush and he goes if this is a crush i don't think i can handle the real thing no. uh, they argue for a while you clearly There's- see kevin smith and his camera people <laughs> in the reflections of the windows <laughs> they did not oh, really? I didn't notice that. yeah <laughs> this is this is one of those instances where the movie is like it, it goes just a li- it dips a little too much into the melodramatic and i feel like this is where his dialogue starts to is is just could have been pulled back a little because the pro- the problem with this is like they they let these two actors just act and that's totally fine that's his that's his purview as the director and you're probably on a budget but joey lauren adams screaming and crying and saying all of this dialogue at the same moment where it's these long ass run on sentences that are like eloquently made just seems so it just seems so out of place for me in this one and i know this is like the pivotal moment of of the, the movie, turning point but i just can't, I can't it's kind of cringeworthy at a certain point where she just keeps going and they're screaming and crying at each other and i'm like this is seems so unrealistic for these two characters and the fact that it's pouring rain on them it's just like yeah. how many more visual cues could you try to beat us over the fucking head with <laughs> man with, i love with, it with their current emotional state and i totally get it but like having a close-up shot of her i think would have like a little bit more coverage in this i think would have helped like mellow out the sort of yeah the rawness of it i think it would have helped uh, like get get the feeling could have come across too without it being bitter like or not being better, but sort of it's like it's like coffee. I want to put a little cream in that thing for me, so it's a little easier to digest. Because right now you're just smacking me over the head with a really bitter. But I also fruit. don't know if I also don't know if her coming back at him afterwards and then kissing him. I don't know if that has enough of an impact. If it's just if it's a little bit more understated with her sort of monologue. I'm not, I'm not talking understated. I'm just saying like she doesn't have um like th- there's th- the scene is at 110 percent from the second they get out of the car and there's no like there's, there's no, no dynamic flow. Yeah, yeah it's not it's not dynamic it's just a hundred percent and to me i'm like it would have been nice if there was a beat or a moment in there where they where she came and brought it back down and then brought it back up obviously that's joey lauren adams performance that was her choice but i just i remember watching that the first time and every every subsequent time thinking like man this is a this is a long scene and it's a lot of dialogue for her to say on one shot where she's scream crying it and it's it's starting to um show how like her inexperience is now it's just the performance is starting to wear out yeah. as she goes on and that was unfortunate for me yeah, I'm I'm semi with you with this. Where to me, this is just another symptom that I had a big issue with in Mallrats, where every character feels like they're the same character once they start getting into these big monologues, because it all just sounds like it's Kevin Smith using flowery words. Yeah, they, they don't feel unique anymore. And it's like what she added was her unique, like her acting it out. I think she did a great job, but it kind of just feels like that was an interchangeable, like bit. And plus, it's like people are trying to sleep. Why don't you just chill out? <laughs> like, yeah, bro, it's happening. <laughs> it's two, two right. in the morning or whatever, bro. Uh, Alyssa lays him out. This is who I am. This is who. You know, sorry, I can't be hunky dory for you. Yada yada yada. Uh, he, he walks back to his car just as he gets to the door. She runs up, jumps in, embraces him. They start making out furiously. Uh, we then jump cut back to Holden and Banky's place, where Banky's coming back from something. Um, 
he walks in to the thing, finds the house in disarray and finds uh, drops his chocolate milk to then we pan over to see Holden and Alyssa in the after the you know the morning after a, a rough night of, or a crazy night of sex or whatever. The couch is tipped over, there's shit everywhere. Holden's got handprints on his uh, shirt from them doing some kind of weird paint fucking. I remember Kevin Smith had some story about why he did that, thinking it would make sense, and it doesn't. Oh, it's uh, weird. I was like, did he put his paint shirt on when he went yeah. to bed? I don't understand. <laughs> uh, so Banky, the milk drops. That wakes them up. Banky leaves. Uh, Alyssa's like, that's, I assume that's not good. He's like, I'll go talk to him. Uh, Banky's on the doorstep. Again, I fucking some children who are getting ready for a Catholic school. And he sits down and Banky's like, yeah, you know, oh, man, I never have enough. Uh, I didn't date any Catholic school girls growing up. Not as, so as it stands, creepy. I know. And then she did her jumper stories. It's like, this is a creepy yeah. scene. Conversation. Um, but then they get into it, right, of like uh, – you know, that was my couch and Banky's being really protective, obviously, and really closed off here uh, in how, you know, that's my couch and blah, 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 and all, all this other stuff about how he's not happy with the relationship. The the main thrust here, right, is like Banky being like, this is going to end badly and I don't want to see uh, her come in and destroy all the work we've put into this. And Holden's like, she's not going to destroy the comic. And Banky has this moment. He's like, I'm not talking about the comic book. He's talking about them and their relationship of best friends or whatever. Um, and ends with, all right, you know, f- fix my fucking couch. I'm going to go get a bagel. I want to watch TV. Uh, and he leaves, right? So we have this thing of Banky and Holden really on the ropes now. Uh, we then jump over to Alyssa with all of her friends. Uh, they're there drinking wine. They're all lesbians. Uh, they're all there drinking wine. Stuff in. <laughs> it's important to the where we're going with it. It's true. Uh, it's true. The one, the one uh, <laughs> lady with glasses, right? Nick is the one, the one woman from Goodfellas who screws the whole thing up. She travels. Remember with the babies? Yeah. Oh, fuck, wow. you're right. She's been to something recently too, and I remember seeing her. That's, like, oh my god, that's funny. Um, but they're having this conversation about stuff in the books. We haven't seen Miss Funny. Why are we even helping you? We haven't seen Miss Funny books in over a month or whatever it is. And she's like, I'm so in love. Man, and then Scorsese in review, man. Get on it, Tim. Get on it. Get on it, Tim. All right. After you conjuring in, in review, all right? Let's <laughs> shit up. You know what I mean? Let's get the views uh, up for this one first. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out in review doesn't work with just anything. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, I'm so in love and she starts talking about how happy they are and what we do and, uh, they, and, and then finally one woman's like, why are we playing the pronoun game? And they find like, what's, you know, I'm, I am not, but when I don't know what Alyssa's plan was that she could get away with it. They're like, what do you mean? I'm not. And she finds like his name's Holden and they all take it. Like she's a shit in the fucking room. And one of them pours the glass and like, all right, to your happiness or whatever to the, you know, another one bites the dust and it's like, Boo, oh man, that's, you know, cause again, she's given up everything in her whole structure for this. Right. Um, this is where we jump back to them, uh, Holden and Alyssa again in bed smoking uh, cigarettes because that was the thing you did back then. And Holden asking the question, "Why me? Like, why now? Why me?" And she's like, "Well, why not you? Why you know?" Why? It's this conversation of she went down the path of being a lesbian uh, because she wanted to leave the door open to any anybody, right? And, she, and Holden's the first man period uh, not, not even sexually that she's liked or felt a connection to in a long time uh and so eventually you know she had to deal with the fact that by saying she was a lesbian she had closed that door which is the whole reason she opened the door in the beginning was to be you know not have it defined by gender so in reality it sounds like she's bi or that, that she would nowadays yeah. modernly define herself as bi but again that doesn't work for why holden will have his freak out here later on or never so whatever. it also just seems like like bisexuality isn't even a known thing in this movie like it seems like you have to be either one or the other uh well again i think that was that was the perception or the prevailing wisdom back in the 90s right yeah we didn't have we we didn't have all those discussions we have now where people are the the concept of like a sexual fluidity was even a concept right it was like you are this or you are that but i think that's kind of i think this scene in spite of that ends up showing like Alyssa's struggle of like needing, like she has this group, the support group that she's fostered over the years because, you know, she came out of the closet and she is gay, but then how, how their identity is built up into that as well. And when one of their own sort of decides to do something else, how difficult that must be. Yeah. 
It yeah. reminds me, it, it, you know, when they talk about how how the 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 lesbian army is going to come after her when they found out that she's like betrayed them, whatever. It reminds you a lot of uh, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, where uh, all the all the lesbian, oh, the gays love Larry. The gays love Larry, and then Larry does like one thing bad, and then like all, all of a sudden he walks into the gate in the lesbian like bar, and everybody's just looking at Larry like all pissed off, and everybody hates him now. <laughs> it's great. Dude. I it's love great. it. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, they talk about then, you know, being in love and how it's, you know, her ostracized now from her group of friends or whatever, but like, that's who she is. And she's, you know, just this person. That's how it's going to be. Awesome. Uh, they end the scene cutely hitting each other with pillows and then making out some more, probably having sex. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah, yeah. Dude. From there, there we, can we, see it. <laughs> from there, we're uh, <laughs> back to the drawing table where Holden's at work and bam, Banky throws down the high school yearbook uh, from, I think she went to Hudson, right? Or she went to Hudson North. Doesn't matter. Throws down the high school yearbook. And he's like, holding like, what the fuck's this? And Banky's like, open it up to page 46, opens it up. It's Alyssa's picture and underneath it is the nickname Finger Cuffs. And what an it, annoying it, asshole, you know? Banky? Oh, yeah. Yeah, stay on your well, own I mean, lane. God damn it. And it's that thing where Banky, like, ah, he is an annoying asshole. And yeah. Holden is an annoying asshole. And this, again, to the time capsule issue of I know as you wrestle with your friendships and stuff, I've seen this happen. I've had it happen where I think you have somebody who is trying, thinks they're doing the right thing. They're doing it for selfish reasons. They, uh, do they even know that? Do they realize it? Like Banky's clearly trying to break them up, but he says he's just watching your back and it's this whole, what are your intentions and how pure are they? And what is the real thing? And yada, yada, yada. But that's a conversation for another time. Uh, finger cuffs. Yes. She had a stupid nickname. So what? uh he's like yeah that's what i thought too but i you know i ran into our friend koei over at the shops and then totally out of left field this weird ass fucking like rap beat that i hate and this koei character that i hate are out in front of the quick stop huge deal to see the quick stop in color for the first time because again i remember seeing this i was like what the fuck uh if you would watch the extended version of mall rats you did get a shot of it in color well remember that wasn't available to me at the time that wasn't available until like 10 years later right (laughs) so (laughs) give me some fucking credit for being there when it happened (laughs) um Anyways, yeah, Coey's out there and just has this monologue about Alyssa Jones. Shit, I know Alyssa Jones. Um, turns out that in high school, him and Rick fucking Darris, of course, the I'm biggest. Rick Darris. I'm Rick Darris. <laughs> That's a perfect name to do that. <laughs> biggest villain in the USQ universe. Uh, I used to hang out with Alyssa in high school. They would go over to her house all the time. Her parents were never home. One time, Rick whipped out his dick in front of uh, Alyssa and started rubbing on her leg and shit. And she just dropped her knees and started sucking him off. And then he looked at me and said, Koei, <laughs> just like that, Koei. So I went over there and I started taking her pants off slow because I'm thinking I'm going to get thick, but she's into it. And so we started having sex with her from, you know, uh, mouth and vagina. He doesn't say it like that. That's as if I would have written it. <laughs> we were having sex with mouth and vagina. I love you, Greg. <laughs> we had a, that day she had us locked in time. weird fucker. <laughs> Uh, we cut back to Banky finishing the story of retelling it, right? And uh, <laughs> Holden's like, what? It's bullshit. It's fucking a bullshit story, whatever. And so he's looking for cigarettes here. This is when he's looking for cigarettes and can't find any. Um, in in uh, uh, He's like, it's bullshit. It's, and he's like, Coey's a lot of things, but he was never an exaggerator. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. And he has some funny joke here. I forget. But again, we're escalating, escalating, escalating. It's, it's Holden getting more and more wound up, right? And uh, – Finally, he's like, what's the game in this? Why would you even care? And like, what What if she has a disease? And this is like the final thing for Holden. He's like fucking right on Banky about this. Like, shut the fuck up. And this one, he shoves him up against one. I swear if you say, oh, this is looking a little peaky. I'll fucking pump your teeth down your throat. And he says before then, right, of like, uh, she's my fucking girlfriend. Get it, Lay off and show some respect kind of thing. And if you say she's peeking him up, he storms out of the house angry. Jason Lee has a moment and he opens the door and he goes, I've been working out, you know. Uh, from there (laughs) I I did the same laugh Greg I did the same laugh at home (laughs) Um, uh, yeah this is when yeah 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 this is when Holden and Hooper go to the record store like we were talking about Blues Traveler uh, number 7 or whatever behind them for the current get to set you a little bit uh, hell yeah Um, and it's this conversation where yeah Holden lays it all out right and so does Hooper of like you know, she has this baggage to, to sex with multiple partners <gasps> at the same time. <gasps> and it's like, uh, you know, Hooper having this whole conversation with him, like, just don't be an idiot. And he, he has a great line of there. Don't fall 50 stories, in my opinion, of you because you're going to get hung up on this bullshit. Right. Like I do the same thing where I want, you know, uh, everything seems new. I want to act like, you know, it, it's a male thing of wanting to rock your world and be fucking the conqueror, the first person there. And it's like, 
anything that's been done under the sun has been done. So like, why even worry about it kind of thing, which of course is the exact right r- thing to take from this. So like, who the fuck cares what she did in high school and what all this other shit, why, why the fuck would you be hung up on this and that you're not the first? There is, I guess, some to it. And she apologizes for it later in their big fight, right? Of like that they do talk about this all the time. And so for her not to have volunteer that she had had sex with men, I guess is an it's, issue to be hung up on, but that's not his, that's not his hang up. He's not hung up about the law. And I don't even want to say lying. He's not hung up about, not having information volunteered to him. He's very much hung up about the axe. Sorry, Kevin. Oh, I was just going to say, like, it is like, I feel like they, he, Kevin Smith did a good job setting this up in the sense that, like, the first time they talk about her uh, being, like, a lesbian and her, like, sexual experiences. She's never, he's like, yeah, you've never had sex because you've never been penetrated. Yeah, like, but, like, she, she made it so, like, he made it so that, like, the, the argument was kind of set up where, so that she, she wanted to win it, you know, and... Mm-hmm. She didn't want to be like, no, I have yeah, been penetrated, you know, exactly yeah. in, in such a good way that like now that like it's not a lie, but like the conversation was set up. I guess it was a lie. I don't know. Here's my whole yeah. thing is, again, if if Holden's argument was here, like she lied to me. OK, right. it's not. She had sex with two people. Oh, my God. She's actually had sex with a man before. It's not like he's not mad about the lying. He's mad about the acts, which so we don't even have to worry about the real yeah. that part of the argument. Um, however, like I said, Hooper's walking around telling him all this stuff. He also is the thing of like, you know, Banky loves you in ways he's not ready to admit. Like, you know, he can see it kind of thing. Uh, and so there's this whole conversation. This is also what we we're talking about earlier, where uh, the little boy comes over with his comic to get him signed. <laughs> that, that's the devil. <laughs> Never turn your back on the devil's <laughs> face, <laughs> right. young brother. So, and it yeah. is this whole thing. He comes back and he's wrong. The things I have to do for, you know, professional, uh, whatever he says, tendencies, courtesies, I forget, to get respect. But basically, he's like, fucking get over it what are you even talking about why and like all of this just goes fucking over his head for some reason he doesn't listen all right great uh then we're on a date with holden and Alyssa. we're at a hockey game worth pointing out of course that next to uh ben affleck here is the guy who played rick darris in clerks he's not rick darris because obviously oh. he's, he's <laughs> i didn't rick realize Darris that. Didn't have a reference but <laughs> i always like that he's still casting his friends into him and so it's yeah this not even minor league hockey team it's just some fucking people playing hockey at the ice rink uh <laughs> And Holden, of course, just fucking sitting there brooding, right? He loves this woman, and he's in, he's at a, he's taking her to a hockey game, and he's just going to brood at her, right? Like, what a fucking prick. But he's there, and Alyssa's trying to have a fun time, and she's cheering for the visitors, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, eventually, though, Holden starts uh, interrogating her, cross-examining her, right? Of like, uh, you know, what's finger cuffs? Or he's, I forget if that's where he starts. I think it might be, right, Kev? Or he's like, what's finger cuffs? You know, I believe so. Fine. Just that yeah, like it's a, yeah. We start going into the high school thing and, and you're talking about what you did in high school. And she's like, Rick Darris. I, I used to hang out with Rick Darris. And what was his name? It was Coey. That's it. Blah, blah, blah. And, and she, she picks up, obviously, incredibly quickly that he's heard the finger cuff story. He's driving towards it. And so, yeah, she's like, she's like oh, Coey, you know, one time, you know, take advantage of my parents never being home. They were there all the time, uh, raiding the fridge, doing drugs or whatever, drinking. Uh, one time, Rick whip, whipped out his dick. <laughs> oh, yeah, what did you do? I blew him while Coey fucked me. That's what <laughs> you no, wanted to hear. Everybody, everybody quiets down. Yeah, everything. <laughs> That's what you wanted to hear, right? Like, I would have gladly volunteered this information if you just asked me. But here you are interrogating me in public, you know, in hockey, or in public, no less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, she's basically – she just storms the fuck out of the arena. And that's when the Rick Darris from Clerks, who was not Rick Darris in the movie, is just like, geez, man, even I knew what you were driving at. Uh, she walks out. Holden runs out. Hey, hey. Grabs her arm. And it's like, well, this isn't a good look, Holden. This is not how you handle the situation. Um, and they get into a screaming match out there, right, of just, like, her, like – Anger that he brought this up, anger that he did this, but then also sympathetic of like, listen, I, st- I love you, right? And like, it doesn't matter. And Holden being like, it does matter to me. Like, I don't know how I feel about <laughs> Batman. <you>. I'm Batman. <laughs> He's a so cool bitch out there, like a moron, right? And so, like, it's back and forth with, you know, Joy Lauren Amst- or uh, uh, Alyssa trying to be like, this doesn't matter. And, like, but like, taking it seriously and understanding he has emotions tied to it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Holden not wanting to fucking hear it at all or whatever. And then I forget what mean thing he says to stone him off, but he says something mean. And, like, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I love you. Don't you love me? I don't know. And he well, fucking walks away like a moron. She runs and cries on a car and pounds on a car for a bit. Um, then I forget if it's a montage or not. I don't think it is. It's just holding crying in, with a bottle of vodka at the house. Banky wakes up from whatever I like, sleeping. He comes out and sits down on the couch and Holden's just sitting there with the one tear rolling on his face. And he's like girl, girl trouble or girl problem or whatever. And he's like, yeah. And they just sit there like wallowing in that. Uh, Banky getting his way. Is it her, her. Is that what it says? Yes. Yeah, which is like super douchey and weird. I thought it was girl or girl. Tr- oh, it doesn't matter. I, I thought um, it was girl trouble. Yeah. 
Doesn't matter. At some point, he he refers to her as her. It was just there's like, also fuck. one little line that she throws out when she's kind of talking about her, her like sexual experiences when she was young, and she. I uh, tried it all. Yeah, she's she's like like Shannon Hamilton recorded her video and then posted yeah, yeah, it somewhere brought it like, or broadcasted it, and it's like, oh hey, yeah. that's the guy that likes to put it in. We know Shannon places. Hamilton. We know he probably fucked yeah. you in an uncomfortable place. It's not as funny right now though in this context. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. No. I'm the queen of suburban legend or whatever. Like, you know, anything else you've heard about me is probably true too. Um, yeah. And so it is like a suburban it's, legend. It's a great scene, I think. And I don't know if it goes back to going on too long. And because, it, it, you know, it, I think on the heels of the brain scene and the timeline didn't happen too long ago. So to have her outside screaming at him again. But I do really appreciate everything that happens here, where it is this whole thing of like, it's why she stayed away from the suburbs, right? Like, she made a lot of mistakes and did a, you know, took a lot of weird turns in uh, her high school days. And so it has kind of soured coming back here, but she comes back for him. And, you know, she's happy with the person she is. She, you know, the journey has made her into somebody she likes, which is powerful, I think, in a lot of ways. Anyways, Holden's crushed. Um, yeah, and so he sat at the thing, and Banky's there. Then he sat at the diner, and this is the Jay and Silent Bob scene. Like, look at like somebody shitting his Cheerios, bong or whatever. Uh, they walk in, sit down. It's oh, how did dirt merchants like you learn about likeness rights? We deal with a lot of, we go through a lot of lawyers, um, and it's this conversation. Yeah, that is there of like you know eventually escalating. Hey, what, what is it? It's like. Hey, Flo, why don't you w- tell Mel to whip me up a bagel, a toasted bagel with cream cheese? Uh, that they it, don't eat, just leave there because they're assholes. The, the Flo reference is from some show. He says it, I forget. Because that's it's where some... Dumb and Dumber also references that show as well, right? I think, yeah. like, yeah, when Dumb, with the, the whole sea bass scene in Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Because when he says Flo here, I was like, oh, yeah, I think they're both referencing the same bullshit, the same like 80s or 70s show. Yeah, yeah, Jay says it afterwards. Uh, eventually, while they sit there and talk about the funny book and how the likeness rights going to keep, or is this going to keep coming? I don't know. Maybe there might be a cartoon and all this other shit. Jay, like you said, Jay would like to be over it anyway. He doesn't really care. Um, eventually, they're like, so what's got you so down? He's like, why the long face horse? Uh, and it's like, yo, girl trouble. Uh, oh, yeah, who is she? I might know her. I, you want to know her? I'm people who know people. Who is it? He doesn't want to say it. He doesn't want to say it. Finally, he's like, Alyssa Jones. And the music stops. And then Jay's like, holy shit finger cuffs you're dating finger cuffs and he's like oh fucking shit so, <laughs> i heard she did this and he's like yeah fuck it. shut the fuck up or whatever i've heard of it all too and it's this whole he's laying it out of course that he can't get this he loves her and can't get this stuff out of mind uh, basically another hooper conversation and i love that her i love that finger cuffs in this movie is basically trip mcneely and can't hardly wait but everybody loves trip mcneely because he's a dude and he's banging girls but oh, sure, yeah, <laughs> Alyssa yeah. is like this whore because it's I mean, awful and stuff welcome to being a woman right like, yeah <laughs> you're, you're a fucking stud if you've had a lot of sexual partners and you're a man you're a fucking slut if you're a girl trip um, mcneely where the horse is coming in Nick, don't worry about the horses, all right? Oh man, Nick, uh, you, you gotta stop talking about horses. It really make me uncomfortable. You can <laughs> only, you can only. Here's what we're doing: we're we're, we're going to give you free reign yeah. on this joke for this entire episode because it makes sense. But once this is done, you're not allowed to bring it up again because it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll probably forget podcast. about it by then. Okay. Remember right, the toilet? It's, it's gonna come up so much, guys. <laughs> Never forget toilet totes. Never forget toilet totes. <laughs> R.I.P. Uh, oh, no. Maybe that's a good reference in KFAF tomorrow. That's maybe it's there is, man. Yeah, uh, so is. This is the, yeah, so you know, we're just talking about your Tracer and Amy, and Bob tells the story of you know this girl he liked from from named Amy. How long ago is this? A couple of years ago. What is she from Canada or something? How don't I know? You, you know, there's about a what is it? There's a there's about a million things I could just about squeeze in the Grand Fucking Canyon. You always want to be a dancer in Vegas. Really that fun stuff. Part. I love that part. Yeah, and they, making they, them human again, where I think they were human in Clerks, even though we, you know drug dealer weird strung out humans Ca- comic book characters or if cartoon characters probably actually more like than likely than not in mall rats and then here they are actually having more dimension and stuff there focus no i can't tell focus on me please please um and like i said this is amy's story right and basically bob word for word had the exact same problem right where uh yeah his this girl amy that he loved you know he the idiot gear kicks in he starts asking about the ex-boyfriend the ex-boyfriend like to bring back uh uh, other people, I believe it's called the Menage a Trois, uh, did it a few different times. And Bob freaks out because, of course, he's sexually inexperienced. He's never had something like this. So he's out for blood, calls her a slut, calls her a whore. Uh, he used you, you know, which is exactly what, uh, you know, uh, uh, Holden told Alyssa outside the ice rink that they they used you. No, I used them. Um, 
and so Holden's taking this all in now, you know, here he is at ground zero or whatever. And like, okay. And, and you know, Bob finishes his story. Uh, Jane and Silent Bob are going to go to Chicago, which of course becomes the comic book chasing dogma. If you ever want to fill in that gap, um, they yeah. get ready though. They leave. It's also the, you know, here I'll try, you know, do or do not. There is no try. Shut up. Will you? And they have a little bit of, you know, I always got to tell that story. They leave. Holden has this moment of like, yeah, I've, I've figured it all out. <laughs> yep. So now we go You're back. Like, oh, you just expect there to be a scene where he walks back and goes, oh, my God, I was so wrong. Like, your past is your past. Yeah. Like, I still want I, I want to be a part of your right. future, not your past. So but simple. instead, typical so man. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. Could, could, yeah. So could. what he does is gets champagne and champagne flutes and some candles, invites Banky and Alyssa to the apartment, to the couch, uh, scoots over a chair. And he's like, I figured out how to solve our problem, of course. Uh, you know, uh Banky, or he doesn't even say that part yet. He Banky insults her, and he gets in his face. I'm gonna tell you once, shut up. Um, he kisses him first at some point, right? Or no? I thought that, that comes after. That's afterwards. Yeah. Shut up. Because he, he, he then laid. <laughs> he then lays out his plan, <laughs> right? Of like, so the idea here is that, yeah, you know, like I feel an experience with you, Alyssa. So I, we need to do something on that level. Banky, you're clearly in love with me. And Banky's like, the fuck I am. He gets up to leave. That's when he kisses him. That's when he sits back down, stunned. Uh, you know, we're going to do, and it basically pitches a threesome, right? Of this will give me the experience on the level of Alyssa. Plus, it's with two people I love. Plus, it's going to help uh, Banky not resent Alyssa anymore. Plus, Banky will finally get to have his fantasy of having se- or you know a romantic connection with me, and then he can unpack all that on his own kind of thing. Yada yada yada. Uh, he lays it all out. Check that I straight up fucking lost it. Like this was something I did not expect at all. I thought it was so fucking funny. And when she was just like, "Don't say it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he yeah, gives yeah. the pitch. It's just like I love. I appreciate how far they took this and how ridiculous this entire premise I, is. I, and really, I, was, I, don't were, I don't know. You were supposed to be <laughs> laughing at this scene, oh, no, Tim. This, this scene is funny and fucked up. Oh, this really? scene is funny yeah. and it's built to I think be it's funny. Awkward, yeah. like, because my problem is like again, these like, I don't like the characters in this movie. I don't think they're well written, but I think that the the message of the movie is well done, and the the comedy I think is funny when it hits. And this to me was an example of that. Yeah, for me, I was just sitting there like, is this really where the movie is going? And then if they go through with it, this has got to be the dumbest ending to any fucking movie ever. And then I love that it didn't happen. I love that they blew up at it. Like, I think it ended, it it started off so bizarre and so absurd. And then it ended, I think, perfectly. Yeah, and that's the thing about it where I think you, you are, you know, your first viewing, especially now, if you've never seen it before, being like, oh my God, is this really what's gonna happen? Like, are they gonna, is this really just like, Holden's fantasy, right? That like he can be this weird stick in the mud. Like I won't budge from my values, but then I do, and then everything's gonna be fine. And it isn't, right? So yeah. he pitches it. Banky says okay. Alyssa says no. Banky says thank God, thank, thank Christ. God. And then he so apologizes good. when everybody looks at him. Uh, and then she lays it out of just like, listen, I've gone down roads like these before, and it won't go the way you think. It's not gonna work. You know, you're either gonna. It, it, there's a million different outcomes. You could resent me. You could resent banking. It ruins your friendship. I could suddenly see, and I highly doubt it, something in banking, and then we, you know, have a connection. And yada yada yada. Like this just won't work the way it is, and I can't be a part of it. And we're over. And and again, she says it all super calmly and super rationally and super adult, and stands up and she's like, she hugs him while he's got a tear rolling on his face, and is like, uh, I love you. I always will. Never forget that. And then she steps back and fucking smacks him so hard and just goes, but I'm not your fucking whore. And walks out and it was like, yes, like such a great moment for her and for that movie, right? She leaves. Uh, Banky gets up silently, goes to his room, closes the door. And then we get uh, a one year later, right? Yeah, I didn't miss anything. We get a one year later uh, where we're back at the Manhattan Comic Convention. Um, Banky's there with a new hat and his new book. No, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Dave. Dave. Baby Dave. Dave. Baby Dave. Baby Dave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, it's the guy from the very beginning, Ethan Supple or Supply. Is that what it is? Uh, mm-hmm. Supply. Yeah. Uh, he's doing the whole thing of like, oh man, this book's great. I love the dick jokes and you this, that, and the other. And like, yeah, so, you know, whatever. It was, it was a blunt man and chronic. He puts down the final issue that is the death of chronic. And uh, he's, Banky's like, oh, I haven't seen this in a while. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Is it true there's going to be an animated series? Was, never happened. Oh, is that what happened with Holden McNeil? He left the industry. I don't know what's going on. Uh, then it's the, I really love Baby Dave or whatever, you know, dick jokes. While this is happening, uh, Holden has made eye contact with Banky from across the way. And Banky's like, it's like the first time apparently they've seen each other in quite a while. Goofy is all shit. 
Yeah. Well, it goes on too long. Oh, it goes on way too long. We're still here. We're still here. But I love that. I think this is the moment, and I might be wrong, but it's around here. You just hear over the PA that a kid got stuck in the escalator. escalator. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't notice that. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. Uh, I think it might be on the the panning. It's great. Um, And then, but again, like it's the whole thing of like uh, Holden holds up Banky's book and gives him a thumbs up, and he's like, thanks. And then he Banky does one of these and like does the share a moment thing, and Holden crosses his fingers. And I don't know if it's just the color around on my tv when he does this and i was like what's wrong with his finger and jen goes smoker finger where his finger is like all discolored from him smoking cigarettes with it all the time um and uh, and so that that was it that's all it was it was a bunch of unspoken while i do think it's goofy as hell and it goes on too long i do I love it i do love it in the way it is these people who aren't in each other's lives anymore but still have that connection and can just silently do that it can silently have that conversation without actually having to go have have a conversation it's yeah, cool it was to cute. see it was, it was the whole oh, good to see you this is cool congratulations all right cool she she's over there if you want to try all right great they still um, love each other you know I, exactly I uh we jump over uh to uh gwen Alyssa's table uh she's there with her, her new girlfriend who is kevin smith's sister in real life who is also the same woman who was the that's why i manually masturbate caged animals for artificial insemination I don't think they're the same character, but that's oh, okay. her same actress, Kevin Smith's sister. And she's like, I don't see what you call these people contemporaries. Like, <laughs> I forget which one is she calls out. Oh, what's the guy with the ears over there? And she's like, that's a Vulcan. Vulcan. <laughs> I'm going to go get a drink. All right, I'm going to go get food or drink or whatever. She leaves. Uh, uh, Amy, or no, uh, Alyssa reaches under a table and starts fiddling with her bag. Uh, Holden walks up. But we don't see his Holden tosses down a comic book. Uh, she looks at it. It's called, uh, she glances at it and says, this isn't mine. He's like, no, it's mine. She looks up. It's Holden. They have this, again, unspoken, unspoken, uh, but like crushing weight conversation here. Again, of like, how have you been? And this, that, and the other. And like, the book is called Chasing Amy. She pages through, you know, I finally had something personal to say again. He, she, she pages through it and sees it's their story ending on him i'm sorry Alyssa. wherever you are kind of thing uh she is welled up with tears uh and like they have they're holding on this moment together of like what's gonna happen next with them and she's just like you know he's like well i gotta get out you know you got you got a line i'll get out of your way and she's like yeah you know gets it's gotten pretty rough here and then references a conversation that i didn't even bring up in this recap when banky has always been a uh, crazy hard ass in school when he called uh, whatever well, he drove a nun to call him a cunt rag and so here she's like, yeah, you can get pretty rough out there. I just saw a nun call a nine-year-old boy or whatever at Conrad. And it's like, oh, cool. You know, call back to like their first conversation. And uh, Holden walks away and her partner returns and sits down. He's like, who is that? And she's like, just some guy I used to know after stumbling. He walks the door, looks back at her, smiles or whatever, and then walks out. And uh, it's back to real life for Alyssa. And she's like, she pulls herself together. And he's like, all right, next. And somebody brings over the book and she starts signing it. And then we pan back as some like knockoff Borgs walk by. <laughs> we yeah. we're, back, we're lost back in the comic and and that is chasing Amy. Little, uh, yeah, your bag seven in. syllables yeah. Oh, yeah. Fine. Haiku in the, the middle. <laughs> you need your five for the first and last line. <laughs> if you're not poetic, no need to fret it. Haikus don't need to rhyme. <laughs> Haiku in review. <laughs> Haiku in review. Everybody. You can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny to write your review in haiku form, just like Ricky McFly did. Fuck yeah, you can yeah. love a friend. It can be non-romantic. That goatee is sick. It's not sick. <laughs> it's, it's not, not sick. It is not a sick goatee. <laughs> it looks sick. Like it, it it's diseased. <laughs> it's crazy uh, how popular they were at one time, you know? And, oh, yeah, dude. Nick, did I you ever hold it? Yep, there it is. Oh, yeah. Of course yeah, I did. I bet. Of course I Second did. Second I can grow facial hair, I was like, because I got to have it. <laughs> Go keep down, baby. <laughs> Daniel <laughs> Edmonds says, Silent Bob is right. Foolish pride leads to regret. The one got away. And then Bumble Boy Wonder says, what's a Nubian? Now that is a shared moment. And kiss my grits. Nooch. <laughs> <laughs> Nooch. You'll have to see it. Now, Ragu Bagu, baby. Ragu. Ragu. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Rag Guys Talk Bad Guys, the podcast within a podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside the Hispanic heartthrob, Andy Cortez. What's going on, Greg? Not much, man. How are you? I'm doing great, dude. Doing yeah, great. Dude, how's that Kashi Go Lean going down? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I, I stopped eating it. I don't know what Kevin's eating, though. It looks interesting. Over there, the glue, Kevin Coelho eating a brown paper bag of chips. They're from uh. Chipotle. <laughs> uh, Forbes 30 under 30, Tim Gettys. It's me. Producer slash producer, Nick Scarpino. Me. Oh, God, God damn it. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, we, rank, we rank all of the old uh, view askew bad guys in here in one <laughs> comprehensive list. So far, the list is number one, 
Shannon slash Michael Rooker from Mallrats. Number two, Dante, his own worst enemy. Uh, boys, who is the enemy, <laughs> the bad guy in uh, here's Chasing Amy? The 90s? Bane? Holden? It's definitely Holden. Yeah. Male insecurity. <laughs> yeah. I would I would say it's either male insecurity or Holden. Like I think he's his own worst night, like yeah, worst bat, like enemy. Definitely. Again, I, agree. I hate to keep saying that, but he's just it's true. He I mean, yeah, these are broken characters. That's what makes yeah. them interesting movies. Yep. So where do we want to rank Holden and his male insecurity? I think number one. I think a lot for for me, a lot of those movies number one. I just think it's a very complex movie. I think it brings up a lot of questions that I think are important for specifically young guys to to think about. Um, I think yeah, I think he's a great antagonist and. I think he's a great antagonist, actually, to his, to his own story. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree that one. he. I agree that I think he is. I think it's him and his male insecurity. I think it's number one because I think it does honestly the most damage. Like you can look at Shan, Shannon Hamilton and Michael Rooker and there, but like the, in the, the end, end the good guy out. wins. Yeah. yeah, the good guy wins, and it's a happy ending. Whereas Holden fucks it up, right? And he fucks up his uh, relationship and on uh, arguably the course of his life based on you know uh, if they would have been happy forever. And I'm obviously extrapolating there. No future spoils. I agree as well. All right, then. So the new list is number one, Holden and his male insecurity. Number two, Shannon and Michael Rooker. Number three, Dante, his own worst enemy. Now it's time to rank the Kevin Smith Views universe. Currently, number one's Clerks. Number two is Mall Rats. I don't think there's any question that this is number one. I think that this is number one by such a, a large deficiency. That it's I agree. I agree. Um, I have this as number one as well. I think it's the most, I think it's front to back, the most well-rounded movie that Kevin Smith, that I've watched so far uh, in this Kevin Smith universe um, with actors and characters that I actually kind of care for. I, I, I'm not so much on the, on the side of all these characters are super unlikable and, and, uh, and irredeemable. I think that, uh, I think that I, really appreciate the growth that we saw from them in this movie and i just think it's a yeah i think it's the best well-rounded movie that he's made so far i i agree with what a lot of andy's there a lot of what andy's saying except for the growth part because i don't feel like there's any growth but i feel like that actually makes the movie stronger in the sense that like or sorry not any growth but um that uh oh man uh uh was the main dude what's his name holden holden like he he doesn't show the growth, and because of that, he doesn't like get what he's trying to get, which is to be with Alyssa. But doesn't he show the growth? Like I would argue, at the end, both him and Banky have grown. Like that's sure. the comic is the thing. Like I have the page pulled up and yeah, I guess sorry, up. you're right, you're right. Like, where they they jump forward in a year and we see that, but yeah. in, I guess I'm talking about in that moment, like he fucks up so royally that it like breaks everything. Both his yeah, relationship reality, with his right? friends. That's right. Yeah, I was gonna say that's like, how, no, that's, can, what, uh, that's how real growth happens. Is that you fuck something up, and then it, and then you remember that forever, and then mm. you choose to be a better person because of it. And I think that's why this is so important. It's interesting that we get to see him a year later, and you can tell he doesn't go there to get her back. He goes there to, to apologize, truly apologize, not that bullshit he was doing before, but to apologize and tell her, "Hey, I've I've grown and I've moved on, and you've moved on, and that's great." There's no. Like at no point do you think he's walking back in there and being like, "Let me tear you away from this girl that you're dating right now." He's he's not, and he's not trying to start another relationship up with Banky. He just wanted to let them know, like this, like I, I upon reflecting on it for a year, like this is where I'm at, and this is the art that I've made because of it. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a movie that I've enjoyed the themes and messages of so much and the characters so little. Uh, but I feel like that is just evidence of how powerful the message is and how like well done. I think that it all kind of comes together in the end. Yeah, yeah. Number one, I think it's number one. Number one, yeah, I, I do too. I think it's I'm the mo- as we said, most complete, best acted. I think there's again, it's something personal to say. Not that Clerks wasn't personal, but Clerks was personal. Like I'm just a shitless layabout, and I need to <laughs> figure that out, kind of thing. Whereas this, I think, has way more to it in terms of you know, like we're talking about growth and self realization, and I think it did, you know, in a lot of ways uh, as a young teen, right, guide my uh, thoughts on you know. LGBTQ on uh, how, how do you hold somebody's past? Why why is it my business? What the fuck somebody else's past is? Shit like that, right? Like it, it was. It is. There's a lot of great messages in this. So currently, the rankings are number one, Chasing Amy. Number two, Clerks. Number three, Mall Rats. Um, next week, this Friday, actually, we're going to be doing Bumblebee for Transformers in Review. 
Um, and then next Tuesday, we're coming back with Dogma. Remember, you can find Dogma on YouTube. Just search for Dogma, and it'll be there. It's in HD. It's the whole movie. It's free for everyone to watch. So that'll be a fun Sweet. thing. Yeah. Until next week. Snoochie boochie. Is that what they say? It's fucking <laughs> baby talk. <laughs>